Hello and welcome to our virtual public workshop entitled Understanding the Use of Negative Controls to Assess the Validity of Non-Interventional Studies of Treatment Using Real-World Evidence. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today. My name is Dr. Rachel Hendricks Stirrup, and I'm the Research Director of Real-World Evidence at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. Uh, today, our workshop is supported by the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, under a cooperative agreement with Duke Margolis and will fulfill a Prescription Drug User Fee Act 7 commitment or PDUFA 7 commitment. Over the years, and with the contributions and help of many of you attending today's workshop, the Sentinel Initiative has grown from a pilot project into an operational program routinely used by FDA for post-market safety surveillance. So as Sentinel continues to mature and new opportunities arise to improve its robust data infrastructure, and a suite of analytic tools. Um, along with that, accumulating experience on how to leverage key capabilities of data infrastructure, there's a growing interest to improve stakeholder understanding around causal inferences and how they can be derived from Sentinel analyses. Given the potential for unmeasured bias and confounding and secondary data sources, the FDA seeks to better understand approaches for identifying bias and confounding, including through emerging techniques like negative controls. Now, while negative controls are not currently used in the Sentinel Initiative, today's discussion will explore their potential utility in regulatory contexts when utilizing real-world data and real-world evidence. So our sessions today will cover a range of key issues along those lines. We will uh, start with an overview of the land or landscape overview of negative control techniques. We'll also explore select techniques that appear promising for regulatory use, and also hear about early FDA planning on methods development projects required under PDUFA. The aim of these methods projects are to one, establish guidelines for automating the identification and integration of negative controls in the Sentinel system, and two, develop approaches for using double negative control adjustments to reduce unmeasured confounds in vaccine effectiveness studies. So given that the FDA is in this sort of exploratory phase with these techniques, it's really important for the agency to hear from stakeholders, um, such as those that we're convening today, on these important issues. We have built in time for a moderated discussion following our panelists' remarks that you'll hear today, um, whereas participants listening into the workshop will have an opportunity to ask questions and provide feedback during our sessions. Now on the next slide, I'll review the panel discussions and presentations teed up on our agenda. So first we'll begin uh, today with session one entitled Introduction to Negative Controls where panelists will provide a level setting discussion on how negative controls can support more robust analyses to support causal inferences in medical product safety and effectiveness studies. The session will be followed by a moderated discussion thereafter. Uh, that will be session two, where panelists will provide an overview of current negative control methodologies. Panelists will review the strengths and limitations of each approach, and also discuss key assumptions and readiness of each of these techniques for regulatory use and purposes. Now, following that, there will be a 30 minute break. And then following the break, we'll return for session three, where we will outline FDA's proposed demonstration projects. This session will also include commentary from representatives from industry, academia, as well as international regulatory bodies. Now to round out this public workshop, we'll hear high level feedback on methodological approaches, proposed demonstration projects, and any outstanding issues or topics raised from the preceding sessions in order to inform FDA's thinking on whether and how to incorporate negative controls as a regulatory tool. Next slide, thank you. Now I'd like to turn to our statement of independence and final logistical reminders before we get started. The Margolis Center, the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy is part of Duke University. And as such, we honor our tradition of academic independence on behalf of our faculty and scholars and neither Duke nor the Margolis Center take partisan positions, but individual members are free to speak their minds and express their opinions on important issues, such as issues we'll discuss today. I'll also add that the conversation today, while supported through a cooperative agreement with the FDA, 
It is not a federal advisory committee, so we will not be voting or making any recommendations as such. We will have just one more slide now uh, with some virtual meeting reminders before we get started with our opening remarks. As virtual meeting reminders, attendees are encouraged to contribute to the meeting through the Zoom Q&A function, and we in the FDA want to make sure that these discussions are engaging and responses, responsive to our stakeholder community gathered here today. So please do not hesitate to submit questions. We welcome your questions in the Zoom Q&A function. We will do our best to bring audience questions into our panel discussions, and some of our presenters and panelists may also respond via the Q&A function as well. We'll also be recording this meeting and we'll be posting the recording of this meeting on our Duke Margolis website for future reference. Next slide. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you all to our presenters and panelists for our first session. I'll ask our panelists if they haven't already to please turn on their videos or cameras as I proceed to introduce them. So thank you all for joining us again for our first panel. Our first presentation will be by Feng Tian, who is the acting team leader in the Division of Epidemiology within the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at the US FDA CEDAR office. Our second presentation will be given by Hector Isurieta, who is an associate director for novel clinical investigations at the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at the US FDA CEDAR office. And lastly, we'll be joined uh, by Zafar Zafari and Zhang Un Park. Zafar is a health services researcher and assistant professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Zhang Un is a PhD candidate at the Department of Practice, Sciences, and Health Outcomes Research. So it's my pleasure to now turn it to our speakers for their opening remarks. We'll start with Feng. Please take it away. Hi, and thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to discuss the native control method. Next slide, please. Here's my disclaimer. Next slide, please. Here's my outline, and I'm going to briefly talk about the native control, the challenges and considerations, the CEDA experience, and lastly, Perdufa 7 commitment on native control in Sentinel initiative. Next, please. It has been six years since the launch of 21st century CoreSat. The use of real world data and real world evidence has been greatly increased and is expanded from post marketing safety studies to pre marketing studies. With different study designs, different challenges coexist with opportunities for every approach. Next slide, please. So this diagram outlines all threats to the non-randomized, non-interventional studies in terms of the study validity and precision. I won't have time to go in detail, but at this point, I want to mention that a male company bio is one of the most important threats as we conduct real-world studies on drug safety and effectiveness. Next, please. So uh, numerous approaches have been established to account for a male confounding bias, either at the study design stage or at analysis stage. Next, please. So uh, in recent years, native control methods has emerged as a useful tool to detect, reduce, and potentially correct for a male confounding bias. You may learn more about it from our four sessions today. Next, please. There are two types of native controls. Native control is Boyer, here we refer to NCE, and the native control outcome, which is NCO. To understand the native control, let's go to the next slide. So first, let's bring native control into causal diagram for our male confounding bias. Here, we want to study the association between E of exposure, R of outcome. CEU refer to mild and unmild confounders, and there are arrows from CEU to both E and O. Next, please. So, negative control exposure is a variable that is not causally related to study outcome, but share the same potential source of bias with exposure. Therefore, in this diagram, 
there's no error from NCE to O, but all errors from E, U to E will also point to NCE. Under these assumptions, if we repeat the analysis for the association between NCE and outcome, and if a non-neural association is observed, this may suggest that a male confounding is influencing the result. Next, please. So similarly, native control outcome is a variable that is not causally related to the exposure, but share the same potential source of bias of the study outcome. So in summary, a native control variable by design should have at least two key assumptions, non-causality assumption and share the same causal structure of bias. Next, please. In addition to a male confounding, native control can also be used to address other type of bias, such as selection bias, misclassification, and information bias. This example shows how native control outcome plays a role to assess detection bias and the differential outcome misclassification. So due to time, we want to go this in detail. Next, please. Native control outcome, uh, native control method has um, next, please. Okay, yeah. So native control method has several nice features that we tend to use it in non-interventional studies, such as the method has broader utility. It aims to address all three types of bias. It can be used to detect bias, to reduce bias, even to correct bias. Multiple native control can also be used to calibrate p-value and confidence intervals. Additionally, native control has the potential to be a tool to routinely check for evidence of bias with adjustment to ensure high quality of real evidence. Next, please. So while native control has some nice features, it brings up great challenges as well. So first, identify a proper identity control often requires subject matter knowledge, such as the clinic and the biological knowledge to understand the underlying mechanisms. On the other hand, we wanted to identify native control in a more objective way, automatically by some automatic process in big data scenarios. Second, Native control methods rely on strong assumptions. We should always check whether these assumptions are met in a study, which may be challenged. There may need some unique considerations in different study design scenarios. So here we list a few here um, and welcome all discussions to this topic throughout the work group. In addition, we should be cautious when we interpret the result. For example, what does a non-neural association mean in a study that apply native control outcome? Think about this. Was the assumption made in this study? Was there any other source of bias that may differ with native controls? This being said, the observed non-neural association does not necessarily indicate a male confounding of the exposure outcome association. Next, please. So in CEDA, we have gained a few experience with native control methods from regulatory submission and the literature review. In addition, CEDA has a few scientific projects related to native control methods. Let's go to the next slide. So this study was from CEDA and the Sentinel collaboration project to evaluate the treatment effect of our antiviral drug in the claims data. The study outcome is influencing complications within first 30 days after the index date. The study applied propensity score method to control for mild confounders and the two native control analyses to evaluate the male confounders. One is fractures of the native control outcome, and the other is native control time period 
during which there was no expected biological treatment effect on influenza complications. So this study demonstrates how we can use native controls analysis to evaluate the confounding control in the observational studies. Next slide, please. So this is a SOSI project that we collaborate with the University of Maryland. The study aimed to understand how native controls have been used in the epidemiological studies on drug safety and effectiveness and to evaluate the assumptions behind the use of native control in these studies. Dr. Zafari will present a few results later in this session. Next slide, please. So these slides outline the Produfa 7 commitment in the next five years to continuously support sentinel methodology development for use of real-world evidence on drug safety and effectiveness studies. The FDA is committed to hold one public workshop on lipid control. That's the reason we are here today. In addition, the FDA will initiate two demonstration projects, one to develop an empirical method to automate the lipid control identification process in Sentinel and integrate it into the tools. The other is to develop a method to use a double native control adjustment to reduce a male confounding in vaccine effectiveness studies. By end of Purdue 7, the FDA will publish a report on the result of this project. Next, please. So this is the end of my presentation. Lastly, I want to thank to my colleagues from CETA, sending the core team at the FDA who made significant contributions to the slide. I may stop here and I pass on the speaker to Rachel and thank you. Thank you, Fang. This was a great presentation. Next, I'll turn it to Hector for his opening remarks. Hello, my name is Hector Isurieta. I am the Associate Director for Novel Clinical Investigations at OVRR in Cyber FDA. Um, my presentation represents the work of a study team uh, led by Yun Lu, myself, and Rich Forshi from Cyber, Yogan Anchilaric and Mike Wernicke from Acumen, and Jeffrey Kamal from Medicare. I'm going to speak about our experience using negative outcomes to account for the effects of unmeasured variables in vaccine effectiveness studies, a project that we started approximately uh, six years ago. Next. This is my disclaimer. Next. Basically, I'm going to discuss uh, how we intended to address and measure confounding using in negative outcomes and other methods, studies in which we have used negative endpoints, and summarize our findings and propose uh, next steps. Next. There are multiple well-studied approaches to address measured confoundings. We are not going to discuss them here. To address the effect of unmeasured confounding uh, not available in the database is a challenge. This is a particularly important challenge for claims studies. In the examples I'm going to present, we use multiple methods to account for unmeasured confounding associated with what we consider were important sets of potential confounding factors and measure in claims databases, physical fitness to care for self, other frailty measures, level of education, health seeking behavior. Which methods we use in these studies? A number of them, restrictions, the simplest one of all, when we use a vaccinated comparator, somebody vaccinated with another comparable vaccine uh, to the one we are testing. Uh, we have also used linkages to the Medicare Current Beneficiary Survey, a survey that Medicare performs in a representative sample of beneficiaries every year. And we have used, as I said already, negative outcomes, which we sometimes call falsification outcomes. Next. In this study of Sostavaz vaccine effectiveness, we use uh, two methods to account for unmeasured confounding. Next. One of them was to compare the rates of negative endpoints between the vaccinated and unvaccinated cohorts. 
In this, uh, we used a set of 13 uh, negative outcomes and set, so how they aligned between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated. The outcomes that were more likely to be associated with the vaccinated cohort are pointing towards the right, uh, rounded here with a, a, red cycle, a red circle, and they include ingrown nail, epistaxis, hemorrhoids, wound of hand or finger, cataract, eyelid disorder, and lipomas. And we define them as potentially associated with health-seeking behaviors. That's why we consider we saw them more likely to be associated with uh, vaccinated. Next. In the linkages for uh, the Medicare current beneficiary survey, we selected 25 responses that were more likely, in our opinion, to point towards a major confounding of importance to us. Things like frailty, uh, what you do to go to the doctor when you are sick or to avoid going to the doctor when you are sick, your level of education, difficulty performing activities of daily life, uh, smoking status, etc. And we see that after matching in black, the responses are very similar between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated cohort with very small standardized mean differences. Next. In this uh, second study, a comparative effectiveness of influenza vaccines among US Medicare beneficiaries ages 65 years and older during the 2019 and 20 season, uh, season we also use uh, health seeking behavior negative outcomes. Next. In this study, we compared effectiveness of all influenza vaccines using the elderly. We included data from over 12 million influenza vaccinated uh, beneficiaries, such as the one presented in this picture. For cohort balance, we use inverse probability of treatment weighting, and we use health-seeking behavior negative endpoints to assess and measure confounding. Next. We see the distribution of main covariates across vaccine cohorts for the five different vaccines used in the study. And we see that following inverse probability of treatment weighting, the differences were very small using standardized mean differences. Next. We also, in table four of the same study, uh, use a distribution of health-seeking behavior indicators, negative uh, outcomes among the five vaccine cohorts we see that the, the use of medical services for cataracts, eyelid disorders, hemorrhoids, ingrown nail, lipomas, urinary tract infection, wound of hand or finger were very close between the different cohorts for the different influenza vaccines with standardized mean differences, which were all under 0.1. Next. In June uh, 2022, the ACIP cited results from this study and another study by our team among the data sources used to justify a preferential influenza vaccination recommendation. Next. In summary, in observational studies, major confounding can often be successfully addressed in the design. Matching, Mahalanovic distance, inverse probability of treatment weighting, adjustments. However, comparing the effectiveness of different vaccines with the same indication provided there is equipoise as we did in the 2019-20 season study may help decrease the risk of major and also unmeasured confoundings. Identifying unmeasured confounding is very challenging. Negative outcomes are potentially useful as we have shown here, but there are multiple other methods to select negative outcomes that other presenters will uh, introduce. There are also uh, linkages with surveys or other databases, which we use in the SOSTAVAX study. They provide data on unmeasured confounders, and this should be continued to be explored both in Medicare and in other databases. We try to use these uh, linkages to uh, assess unmeasured confounding by physical fitness, frailty measures in general, level of education, attitudes towards medical care, health seeking behaviors. Next, as next steps, we propose to use double negative controls. 
we plan to use double negative controls, including focusing on health seeking behaviors, biases, in claims studies of vaccines for influenza and other vaccine preventable diseases. We suggest to start with the seven negative um, health seeking behavior outcomes we uh, define in the influenza study that I already mentioned. We also suggest the use of negative health seeking behavior exposures to produce the pairs of negative outcomes and uh, exposure. In this case, breast cancer screening for females, prostate cancer screening for males. Next. And I would like to acknowledge our collaborators from the FDA, Acumen, LLC, and Medicare. Um, thank you. Thank you, Hector. Next, we will hear from Zafar and Zhang Un. Please take it away. Sorry, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Zafar Zafari. I'm an assistant professor at University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. It's a pleasure to be here with uh, John Gong Park, my PhD student. We are going to present the findings of our study on the state of use and utility of negative controls in pharmacoepidemiologic studies. I have a lot of content, so I try to be as fast as possible in 15 minutes. Next. Um, this study is funded by FDA, and I would like to acknowledge the collaborators. Next. Pharmacoepi studies often use real world data, and real world data are often challenged by various sources of bias, including confounding, selection, and information bias. And the use of negative control has been on the rise over the past few years. Next. These are the DAG diagrams of uh, the confounding bias, selection bias, and differential exposure measurement error. Um, next. There are two main assumptions of negative control, as mentioned earlier. Um, assumption one, or exclusion restriction, the lack of causality between the NCE, the negative control exposure and outcome, and also the NCO and the primary exposure. The second assumption is the U comparability assumption, basically assuming the shared same confounding structure for both the negative control association and then the exposure outcome association. Next. So we um, try to um, review the state of use and utility of negative controls in pharmaco AP studies. Next. We conducted a literature search um, through September 2020. Um, uh, Different databases, PubMed, Embase, Synod, Cochrane Library, Escopus, um, and Dissertation and Thesis Global. Any pharmacoepidemiology study that used negative control for utilization, safety, and effectiveness um, were included. Next. We identified 6,043 articles after screening and reviewing abstracts and titles, 588 of them we included 184 studies in our final review. Next. The next few slides show the baseline characteristics of um, these studies. As you can see, most of them have been published in most recent years between 2017 and 21, indicative of advancements of methods um, in this period. Uh, 50, more than almost 50% of the study the studies originated from North America, 33% um, in Europe and other regions. Next. CORE study was the most um, common study design, followed by case control study and self-controlled case series. Next. In terms of data sources, healthcare administrative data use um, have been used by 114 study, studies, followed by electronic health record data and research data. Next. Um, 91 studied, uh, studies only used NCO, or negative control outcome. Um, 54 studies only used NCE, or negative control exposure. And 34 studies used multiple, ideally both NCE and NCO. Next. In terms of the type of bias, um, most of the studies um, address on measure confounding, so 93. And then 10 for information bias, 7 selection bias, 2 protopathic bias, and the others did not specify. Next. We identified four main domains of utility for negative control. The first one was bias detection, second bias correction uh, in the effect estimate and calibrating the confidence interval. The third domain was calibration of p-value and then the fourth domain was performance assessment of different methods of pharmacovigilance or analytical methods in pharmacoepi. We're gonna talk about them more next. 
The first domain was bias detection. Out of the 184, 81% of the studies have used negative control for this purpose. Most of them have used a statistical significance or p-value to rule out the presence of bias, although um, a few studies um, indicated presence of bias, even if the p-value was not statistically significant. Um, if the direction of the bias was in line with the a priori hypothesis of the investigators. And less than 50% of those studies reported detecting of a bias. Next. This is a formal representation of how um, negative control exposure can be used for bias detection. So if one regress the primary outcome y over z, which is NCE, if the coefficient becomes statistically significant and the lack of a causal relationship between Z and Y, that could be indicative of potential bias. Next. A good example for this is a study by Yuan et al. 2020, looking a retrospective study, looking at the effect of PPI use on incidence of rheumatoid arthritis. They use three NCOs to detect um, potential confounding bias and one NCE for the protopathic bias. The study did not find any association in the negative control analysis, um, so uh, no bias. Next. The second domain was the bias correction, and we found 16 studies that use negative control for um, bias correction. 14 out of them were published between 2017 and 2020, showing the advancements of methods of bias correction during this period. And we identified three main approaches for bias correction. Uh, the first one was a difference in difference or the simple subtraction. Um, the second one's empirical calibration of confidence interval by Shumi et al. 2018. And the third one was the double negative control adjustment by Shi et al. 2020. Next. This is the basic um, representation of the difference in difference model. So if assuming a linear relationship and um, the same magnitude and direction of bias over both the treatment of interest and, and the negative control exposure uh, denoted by Z, um, one can subtract the coefficient of NCE in the regression of the primary outcome over Z from the coefficient of treatment in the, in the regression of the primary outcome over treatment. And assuming those assumptions and conditions, um, this could correct for the bias. Next. A good example is a study by Gruber et al. 2018, a cohort study looking at the effectiveness of rotavirus vaccination on gas gastroenteritis incidence. They um, used the placebo arm of the trial as, as the negative control different scheduling, and they found significant results for the timing of the first dose, uh, less than six months versus uh, larger than six months for RV5 after the, the difference in difference. Next. Next. Um, most of the difference in difference studies um, have been used in drug drug interaction, and some of them, most of them, actually use the ratio of the incidence rate ratio. Obviously, in the logarithmic scale, this is equivalent of a simple subtraction in in a linear scale. Next. A good example is the study. Um, okay, so this. Um, the second method under the bias correction was the empirical calibration method proposed by Shumi et al. in 2018, which uh, I'm not going to get into details because um, Dr. Shumi is among the presenters. He's going to provide more details. In brief, they have a multiple set of uh, negative and synthetic positive controls to build the empirical null distribution. And a good example for this is a study by Lane et al. 2020. They, it was a core study looking at the safety of hydroxychloroquine in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. They used 67 negative control outcomes and synthetic positive controls. And after the empirical confidence interval calibration, they showed that hydroxychloroquine is associated with excess cardiovascular mortality uh, among the patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Next. The third main approach under bias correction was the double negative control adjustment proposed by Shi et al. in 2020. This is an expansion of the control outcome calibration approach or COCA by uh, Tachkin, Tachkin. And um, they also provided a nice example in their study. They look at the um, 
uh, effect of DTaP IPV HIV vaccine on the risk of medically attended fever, and then they use a pair of NCO as injury or trauma, and an NCE um, as ringworm, and the, uh, using the double adjustment method, they showed a slightly elevated risk of fever for DTaP IPV HIV vaccine, although it was not statistically significant. Next one. The third um, utility domain um, was the calibration of p-value proposed by uh, Shumi et al. in 2014, uh, using the same um, principles as the um, uh, confidence interval calibration. They use a set of um, negative drug outcome pairs to um, make and build the empirical null distribution. Next slide. A good example for use of negative control in p-value calibration is the same study by Shumi et al. Um, they replicated a core study on the effect of isoniazid on acute liver injury. They had um, 34 uh, negative drug outcome pairs and they built an empirical null distribution from these negative pairs and they showed that the isoniazid effect was still significant after the p-value calibration. Next, please. So if you look at the figure on the right, the orange area shows the um, result of a statistical significance after the p-value calibration uh, versus before the p-value calibration. Next, please. A good example um, is the study by Morales et al. 2021, looking at the effect of ACEIs and ARBs on COVID-19 diagnosis and outcomes. They used 123 NCOs or negative control outcomes to uh, calibrate p-value and um, they found no statistical significance for effect of ACEIs or ARB on COVID-19 related outcomes. Next. The final domain is the performance assessment of different met methods in pharmacovigilance or um, analytical methods of uh, pharmacoepi. So we try to put them in two subcategories. First one, a study that use negative control to validate a you know, risk identification method in pharmacovigilance. And then second, a study that use negative control to compare analytical methods in pharmacoepi to mitigate bias. Next. Um, the risk identification methods in pharmacovigilance, we have various analytical methods. They can be validated and tested against a set of known, null, or non-null um, drug outcome pairs, and against a series of matrix such as uh, AUC, sensitivity, and specificity. And the studies by Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, Partnership or OMOP, are all in this category. Next, please. So a good example is a study by Ryan et al. 2013. They compared the performance of seven risk identification methods using 399 drug outcome pairs, either as positive or negative control pairs. And they showed that the self-controlled methods had higher uh, predictive accuracy compared to the other methods. Next slide. The second subdomain was the use of negative control to compare the um, different analytical methods. And a good e example for this is Davis et al. 2017, looking at the effect of um, uh, nicotine replace replacement on suicide and self-harm potential risk. They um, used, uh, they compared two analytical methods, the instrumental variable approach and the conventional regression approach, and how much these um, uh, approaches are capable of capturing bias. So they use an NCO as urinary tract infection, and NCE as uh, prescribed drug unrelated to a smoking, and they showed no bias for the IV approach while the conventional approach showed some uh, biases. Next. And finally, we also evaluated the studies based upon their attempts to test for the assumptions of negative control. So as for the first assumption or the exclusion restriction, uh, we identify three main mechanisms that studies usually used to rule out the, the causality. And one was the logical implausibility, one second was the clinical implausibility, and the third one was no earlier or prior published evidence. We also found that three reference sets as EU ADR, OMOP, and uh, reference sets, and also an automated 
uh, algorithm proposed by ODC, which all use uh, three main resources of data, um, a structured drug labeling by both US and Europe FDAs, a spontaneous um, adverse drug reaction, uh, reporting systems, and also the uh, prior published studies and expert opinions. Next, please. As for the second assumption, which is the U comparability assumption, it obviously is more challenging. There is to date no standard uh, empirical test for that. However, um, um, it's, we found eight studies that attempted to um, um, shed some light on the um, similarity of confounders by comparing the distribution of measured uh, confounders between the negative control outcome association and exposure outcome association under the premise that um, similarity in major confounders could provide some le level of reassurance for um, similarity in unmeasured confounders. And some studies also made extra efforts in reweighting the, the negative control sample based upon the covariates, which um, distributed, uh, which um, provided unbalanced distribution between the negative control outcome and then the uh, exposure outcome association. Um, uh, there is a recent study by Shi et al. Um, she's going to present more the dance algorithm and that um, under some uh, under the disconnected network um, of negative controls, they have this empirical test of subcovariance uh, matrix um, um, that she can uh, provide more details on that. But um, that's only under certain conditions of the disconnected um, network of um, uh, negative controls. Next slide, please. In summary, we identified 184 and reviewed them in PharmacoEP. 81% of these studies um, have used negative control for the purpose of bias detection. We also identified other utility domains such as the bias correction, p-value calibration, and performance evaluations of epidemiological methods. Um, we also uh, found that several um, studies, uh, the application of several key methods have been on the rise in the past few years, particularly the empirical calibration methods and the double negative control adjustment for vaccine effectiveness studies. Next. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Zafar um, and uh, Jong-un. Thank you everyone else for your opening remarks as well, uh, Fung and Hector. Uh, we appreciated uh, your presentations as well. So now we are going to move to our uh, short discussion to begin to close out this session. As a reminder, anyone in the audience can submit questions through our Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And also some of our presenters and panelists may respond to those questions via that same Q&A function. So now I would like to uh, turn to my first question for our panelists. Um, I would like to know, and, and everyone would like to know, how can negative control support causal inferences? Particularly, are there any unique considerations for leveraging, leveraging negative controls in a regulatory context versus a research context? I'll open up. Um, that question to our panelists. Maybe I can maybe I can provide some uh, quick answer to that. So based upon our work, um, I think all the four domains, um, especially the first three domains that we identified for the utility of negative control are all directly relevant to the causal inference. So um, especially when it goes to the p-value calibration and the confidence interval calibration and correction of the point estimate, I think all of them are um, sort of changing the the causal inference, the statistical inference of, of the main exposure outcome association. So I think that uh, the use of negative control could directly um, be relevant to um, and inform the causal inference. Thank you, Safar. Um, I don't know if you had a, 
Any thoughts around that question? I'm, I'm happy to ask it um, one more time, um, particularly how can negative controls be used to support causal inferences? What are some unique considerations that come to your mind um, as far as leveraging negative controls in a regulatory versus a general research context? Um, thank you for the question. Um, as Dr. Zabari mentioned that, uh, especially when um, native controls are used to calibrate the p-values or confidence intervals or um, correct the point estimates or the um, confidence in some intervals coming um, with that, um, it's changing the, the causal inference of the study. So, and the p-values and the confidence interval and um, essentially the conclusions that's drawn from um, the results. So based on when using this method, of course, these methods are um, becoming more and more prevalent in the research practice, and which means that these studies um, using the pharmacopoeia studies and other epidemiological domains will be um, reviewed in the regulatory agency, essentially, and also be used in the regulatory agency um, in a more proactive sense as uh, the Sentinel Initiative is already doing. So um, to, I think it is very important to actually understand this method and should be able to evaluate um, the rigor, rigor and also the validity of the method as part of the statistical analysis, analysis, um, analysis method, just like um, regression method, propensity score method, and other types of statistical method that are used, often used in the field. So I think it is very important to understand the method and should be able, uh, we should be able to critically evaluate um, this method as readers and all users. And um, I think this also applies to the regulatory agency. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, Hector and Fung, I, I see you're both um, uh, here with us on camera now. Um, the question that was asked um, is how can negative control support causal inferences? and do any unique considerations come to mind with respect to leveraging neg negative controls in a regulatory versus research context? And Hector, I think you're speaking on mute. Yes. In uh, where we are right now in the examples I presented, I'm using an unverified set of potential health seeking behavior negative outcomes. Uh, we have not yet matched them with a comparable set of uh, negative exposures either. So at this point, this cannot by itself be used uh, for causal inference. However, in the second example I presented, the 2019-20 Comparative Effectiveness Influenza Study, the fact that the, let's call it empirically defined set of potential healthcare seeking behavior negative outcomes, were so well balanced between the different groups does provide strong reassurance, in my opinion, that the effect of a major confounding, if anything, in regard to health seeking behavior was small. If you were to accept that the seven negative outcomes uh, we use are really up to a point uh, indicators of uh, unmeasured confounding bias by health seeking behavior, you could refute the assumption, but it would be difficult to say that there is important residual health seeking behavior of bias in that particular study uh, when all of the seven were so perfectly, almost perfectly aligned. It's, it would be difficult to justify. So I would go as far as saying that in that particular example, but when we find a, a, an effect, uh, a difference as we did in the herpes zoster study, then we need to be able to quantify it. We, we would need to either use simplifying assumptions, which we are not willing to do at this point, or accept that we just measured there was some degree of unmeasured confounding and, and stop there, but we cannot go as far as to go into causal inference. Double negatives, as we plan to project to, to study in the future, might, might get us there. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, uh, so I like to bring cost, uh, bring control concept into 
a causal inference framework and uh, we can use try like the causal diag to to demonstrate it and to think through that so if you can bring back to my slides i think it's number six is it number 16 Um, I think we probably don't have much time to um, open the slides. Um, apologies for that, but um, you're, you were mentioning that slide 16 illustrates your point in uh, answer to the question. Oh, it looks like, okay, we've got it. Um, next two slides, maybe A, I think it's maybe uh, next. Oh no, 18. Can you go back to um, this causal diagram? Back, back. Oh yeah, this one. So, so th this is a this this is a um, causal diagram for um, addressing the uh, male confounding issues. So when we conduct a study, we need to think through what's the consideration about um, the conf a male confounding over there. And from there, in terms of the first assumption, non-causality, you may also think about what are there any common causal structure over there, and they tend to which uh, the causal share the causal structure, and uh, it depends on um, how much to to how much extent the the control uh, could be address these issues. So if you can go to the next slide. So I don't have much time to talk about during my presentation, and this is another example to use a causal di uh, causal diagram to talk about the other type of bias. So, so for, for this study, um, the, uh, the investigator wanted to uh, evaluate the studying use, whether studying use increases the risk of type 2 diabetes. Because the studying use see the doctor more often than non-users, so there could be some potential bias maybe introduced and lead to the potent differential outcome misclassification. So to address these issues, the investigate consider another disease, peptic uh, uh, ulcer. So this disease has no plausible mechanism that studying use will affect the risk of peptic seeker. And on the other hand, peptic circle would be more likely to be diagnosed among better monitors patient. So that's the rationale they consider um, this disease or genetic control outcome for the study. And so, so aside from that, I think um, they identify the appropriate genetic control um, is very important and it's based on lots of knowledge. And also you need to think through during your studies, you need to think through like the, what is the purpose of the study? Um, and the, and what is the study design in terms like native, if it's for um, cohort study or case control study may have different consideration about the study population and the exposure outcomes. And the other thing is like, um, if you wanted to study or, um, or outcome with a long-term such as a treatment effect, um, long-term cancer risk, then if you think about um, um, the outcome, uh, the genetic control outcome would be possible or appropriate to consider a, um, a acute event. So that's all into our considerations. Thank you, Fang. Um, this is extremely helpful and a very uh, thought-provoking and useful discussion. I want to thank all of our uh, panelists, our session one panelists, uh, for joining us today and providing everyone with this incredibly useful information. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time and we will proceed to move forward with session two. Um, I would like to encourage our uh, speakers and panelists to um, engage in our uh, audience Q&A function. Should there be any questions that you might want to answer, please feel free.
to do so. Now I will turn to our session two panelists. Um, if if uh, our session one panelists can uh, please go off camera and our session two panelists please come on camera, we can go ahead and get started. Um, so for this next session entitled An Overview of Analytical Techniques, a Review of Negative Controls, we'll provide an overview of techniques related to the use of negative controls. Uh, we'll have a series of focused presentations that will consider existing methods regarding strengths and limitations and key assumptions and readiness of these techniques for regulatory assessments. Um, I'd also uh, first and foremost like to point out that uh, one of our panelists, Dr. Uh, Zushi, um, uh, with feedback from other speakers on the panel and the workshop planning team. Uh, they developed an accompanying document that is posted uh, or will be posted on the Duke Margolis event webpage uh, for reference and, and for public consumption. It's a concise table outlining approaches that will be overviewed during this session and intended. it is intended to be a helpful tool to understand the techniques that we'll cover during this session. In addition, we've posted key references for additional background reading on these techniques, and that will also be found on the Duke Margolis event webpage. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to turn to our speakers for our second session. Again, this session is entitled An Overview of Analytical Techniques, A Review of Negative Controls. Uh, again, I'll ask our session two panelists to uh, please turn on your videos as we get started with introductions. Our first presentation will be uh, Eric uh, Chetskin. He's a Ludi Family President's Dis Distinguished Professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania with a joint primary appointment with the Perelman School of Medicine, Department of Biostatistics, Epidemiology, and Informatics. Our second presentation will be by Zhu Shi, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Biostatistics at the University of Michigan. Our third presentation will uh, be by Eric Comerfield, who's, an, who's a research assistant professor at the University of Minnesota. Lastly, we'll be joined uh, by, uh, for our final presentation, Patrick Ryan and Martin Shuami. Patrick is the vice president of observational health data analytics at Janssen Research and Development. Martine is the Senior Director of Observational Health Data Analytics at Johnson & Johnson and is a Research Fellow in Biostatistics at University of California, Los Angeles. Both Patrick and Martine are here today in their capacity as representatives of the Observational Health Data Sciences and Informatics or Odyssey community. So now I'll turn it over to Eric who will give us our first presentation for this session. Eric, please go right ahead. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to introduce some um, negative control techniques um, to this audience. So let me just get started. Next slide, please. And so this is, I wanted to acknowledge a group of collaborators and um, former colleagues uh, who have worked and contributed to some of this work. Next slide, please. So as we know, causal effects, um, uh, the, the, the enterprise of, of inferring causal effects from observational data uh, bring into consideration confounding. And these are these factors that are known common causes of A and Y, A being the treatment, Y being the outcome throughout my presentation. And so it typically requires adjusting for such factors X. And, um, and one is often interested in the quantity given here called the AT, the average treatment effect, that is the um, causal effect of the, the outcome expressed in terms of potential outcome. And the first term, the mean of Y1 is the outcome for the population if one were to intervene and treat uh, uh, everyone with the active treatment. And Y0 if one were to intervene and um, treat everyone with a comparator, which could be uh, not treat anyone at all. Um, key identification assumption is typically that there is no measure confounding. And so this is akin to assuming that condition on your measure covariates you have a study that's as good as randomized. This, of course, not empirically verifiable unless you can actually randomize the treatment. And so causal inference is a, is a dangerous enterprise from observational data. And so we need tools to, um, to assess their credibility in practice. Um, next slide, please. 
So a metric in founding is variables such as U here, which essentially are isomorphic in terms of their graphical representation to the X's that I had before. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna suppress the observed covariates and imagine that we have adjusted for those. Um, and so we worry about uh, these unmeasured factors, unmeasured common causes of the treatment and outcome because they can, co they can create spurious association between the treatment and outcome, even if the former does not cause the latter. Um, and so uh, this is really the most controversial issue in, in, in reporting and interpreting um, analyses based on observational data. There are some techniques that exist to try to address this. Um, instrumental variable methods are probably the oldest method. Um, one shortcoming with instrumental variable methodology is that they essentially require ability to adjust for any measure confounding of the instrument. And so often people try to find quasi-experimental designs where uh, it is imagined, such as in Mendelian randomization, that the, the instrument were randomized by, by nature effectively. Um, what we want to, what the, the purpose of this meeting and, and my talk today is to discuss very briefly certain, describe certain methods using so-called negative control that have been introduced in the first session. Next slide, please. So imagine for illustration that we're interested in assessing the effect of mater maternal stress on a baby's birth um, weight. Next slide, please. Um, what the, the idea of a negative control here is that if one is concerned about a measure confounding, uh, one might look at the, um, the variable Z here um, based on the premise that there, is, there might not be an effect from the father's stress, a causal effect from the father's stress um, to the infant's birth weight uh, upon adjusting for the mother's stress. There's no biological reason for such an arrow to exist. Um, next slide, please. And, and one could then use that to assess the extent to which certain family factors are actually present that uh, introduce residual confounding. And the idea here would be to check whether upon adjusting for A, whether there is a remaining as, uh, association with, with, with Z on the outcome Y, adjusting for other measured covariates as well. Next slide, please. And this is an example I should acknowledge from David Smith's paper. Um, so this is an example of what we've uh, has been introduced earlier as a negative control exposure, and I've, I've reproduced the, the, the DAG here, and I've formalized the assumptions in terms of potential outcomes for those of you who are familiar with them. Uh, the first assumption that of this exclusion restriction that Z should not affect Y if you were to intervene on A, on the treatment, uh, is represented by the first equality. And the second equality essentially formalizes the idea that if you were to condition on the unmeasured confounder, it would be irrelevant. It would become irrelevant for the outcome and therefore create this independence. Um, next slide, please. An example of, 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 of um, another example of a negative control outcome is again in this, the, the flu shot example, flu in, um, vaccine example, where one is interested in assessing the effectiveness of uh, influenza vaccination, the real world effectiveness of influenza vaccination on mortality during uh, flu season. And this, this paper by Jackson and colleagues, they found a 50% reduction in risk of all cause mortality during the winter. And they call that in question. Next slide, please. And so what they, and they were concerned about confounding by health-seeking behavior, which is a real concern in such settings. Uh, next slide, please. So what they did then is use mortality before the flu season to detect confounding bias. And this is uh, what has earlier been described as an, as an example of a negative control outcome. Next slide, please. And so these two types of negative control, the negative control exposure, in which is formalized in the first bullet point here as before, and the negative control outcome that has been added to the graph. And so this graph now represents both uh, the NCE and NCO, and can be encoded likewise, the negative control outcome in terms of uh, potential outcome as expressed in, in the second box, um, that can, uh, upon intervening on both the treatment and the negative control, um, the outcome should not be um, affected by either. Uh, and likewise, the outcome, the negative control outcome would become independent of both the treatment and the negative control exposure upon conditioning on the on measure confounding factor. And so these are essentially formalizing these ideas that these, these variables should satisfy certain, certain null hypotheses. Um, and we can, we'll have some additional example of where such knowledge might come from later on. Uh, 
um, and, and that they should be relevant to the, to the source of confounding. They should be relevant to you, uh, which also implies that conditional, had we observed you, they would become uh, irrelevant for the outcome of the exposure, depending on whether we're talking about a negative control exposure or outcome variables. Now, I should emphasize that these assumptions, like all causal assumptions, um, are not testable. And one should reason about them. And I'll try to give some examples. Uh, I'm sure, I believe we'll also give additional examples where uh, an investigator can really think carefully about how to make these assumptions as credible as possible. Uh, and so like all causal inference methods, they do require some care and understanding of the problem at hand and the potential mechanism at play that you're trying to either detect or correct for. Next slide, please. Now, this is a busy table that, that is meant to illustrate, um, I'm not gonna go over it, uh, all of the rows and columns here, I don't have enough time, but it's meant to illustrate different sources of, of, of examples of um, DAG structures that will, um, can be used to determine whether or not one might have enough scientific knowledge to, to uh, believe they have access to a negative control exposure or outcome variables. The, the one I wanted to, uh, I'm gonna maybe highlight two of them, one is the, the IV, the instrument of variable, as it turns out, uh, an instrument of variable, as we've discussed in our paper, a valid instrument of variable is actually can be thought of as a valid as a valid uh, negative code exposure, negative control exposure. And this might be surprising because there is no arrow from U to Z. In fact, that is a requirement on IV. But by collider certification bias, um, Z would become relevant for you upon condition on A, which is really the condition that we're looking for. And so one could actually use our methods to implement a non-parametric instrumental variable technique, which one cannot typically do with standard IV methods. It typically requires uh, additional functional form assumptions. I don't have time to discuss any of the other examples. And so uh, next slide, please. Um, so I think this is one of the most compelling illustrations of negative control variables uh, at, at, in action. Um, this is uh, settings that's, that's very common in uh, environmental epidemiology where one is interested in assessing the causal effect of air pollution, say at time T, on, on an outcome, a health outcome, hospitalization in the elderly, or um, if, let's say in the, uh, at, time, at time T, uh, the, the, the following week or the following day. And one is worried about unmeasured confounding. Uh, and, and so what's amazing about, about this setting is that typically what people uh, have available to them are time series data on air pollution, time series data on outcomes for a particular geographic area, a county, a state, a city. Um, and they will try to uh, correlate the two and, and, and account for confounding to the extent possible. And what's nice here is that the time series itself and reasoning about time um, provides valid negative control exposures and outcome variable. And in fact, as displayed here, the outcome in the prior time, the YT minus one, cannot causally be impacted by the treatment. And therefore, uh, and by virtue of being the, the outcome process of interest, will be, um, will be correlated with, with you. Um, with the, the source of unmeasured compounding. And so it's, it's both uh, guaranteed to be a valid negative control outcome by virtue of, of time structure, it comes before the, uh, the exposure, and um, by virtue of being the nature of the outcome um, is also um, expected to be relevant for any uh, measure confounding you that affects your outcome at time T. And likewise, one can reason about a, the, the exposure, the air pollution exposure, after the, the, the outcome is measured, so at T plus one, as a valid negative control exposure. I, I won't go over those details in the interest of time. Um, I should also mention that beyond these examples, um, negative control uh, variables have also been used in genetic research and batch effects, um, and in which case they use biological knowledge to, to um, identify control genes to remove on unwanted variation, which is the name they give to confound in the systems. And of course, um, the, the, the issue that's um, important to our discussions today, drug and vaccine comparative effectiveness and safety, and you've already seen some examples, um, uh, but more broadly use of secondary treatments or outcomes in electronic healthcare records, um, particularly those uh, outcomes that have been explored for safety, reasons and, uh, and, and no evidence of an association with the treatment at hand can be found and can be recycled as potential negative control exposure. And likewise, um, for, for uh, safety, uh, safety outcomes. Um, uh, 
one of the nice features of uh, in this particular case is that they, you may actually have a rich set of, of negative control variables, whether they are exposure or outcomes. And this is, I believe, uh, what Martin is going to discuss later on with the, the p-value calibration that tries to leverage uh, availability of, of such multiple negative control variables in in in, in a careful way to to um, to detect and potentially recalibrate your inferences, uh, accounting for the presence of potential presence of unmeasured confounding. Next slide, please. All right, so as, as we described, there really are three uh, goals that one could try to achieve with attain with negative control variables, and they are increasingly um, uh, ambitious as you go down this table. Uh, one could simply use them to detect, to try to detect confounding bias. And I've given some references here. These are not complete references, but they're uh, sort of flagship references for a lot of these methods. So time series studies go back to Flanders' work back in 2011. Um, and and um, using future uh, air pollution exposure was also described in that paper. And it's an excellent paper that um, I highly recommend folks to. Uh, um, one could try to uh, incorporate negative control to reduce the, the, the extent that your causal effect might be confounded. Um, and uh, the most ambitious of all, one could try to correct for, for confounding. And there, uh, as we said, defects and differences could be thought of as a negative control outcome correction method where one assumes the, uh, the association between the unmeasured confounding and the outcome is the same, or the outcome of interest is the same as with the pretreatment outcome. Uh, we formalize these, these assumptions and formal negative control uh, uh, outcome uh, methods, um, both using generalized forms of difference and differences in paper seven and uh, calibration type methods, uh, so-called COCA, which I'm going to briefly spend the last two minutes I have describing. Next slide, please. And so um, don't worry about the words. I'm just going to focus on the picture here in the interest of time. And so the idea here is that uh, rather than drawing you, you, you consider the most extreme form of confounding, which is in fact your potential outcomes. So potential outcome is the outcome. For instance, Y equals zero is the outcome that a patient would experience in the future if they were not giving the treatment. And so that's the most uh, probably the, the, the best predictor of how, how the patient is, will, will do. Uh, if those that predictors captures the arrow from that predictor to the treatment, the, from Y equals zero to the treatment, and obviously to the outcome, because it predicts the outcome, it is then encoding the, the unmeasured confounding. And the idea here is to think of the negative control outcome um, W here as a proxy as a proxy for that for that measurement. And so yeah, like your outcome in, in your the measure the measurement of your outcome prior to treatment might be a, a good candidate W, as I mentioned earlier. And once you think of it that way, then next slide please. Um, one can reason about, well, if that's the case, then uh, assumption one, which is the exclusion restriction assumption, is a, might be a reasonable assumption because it essentially says that um, the, the negative control outcome cannot be caused by the exposure. And assumptions two and three um, essentially encode the relevance assumption. The first one is um, th that that should be an, a not independent um, statement there of W should not be independent of Y equals zero. There should be an association. That's the negative control relevance assumption. And the second assumption captures the, the important assumption that allows identification here that if you had measured the unmeasured confounder, Y equals zero, it would render the W independent of the treatment. Um, and so if you're familiar with measurement error, essentially W is thought of as an error prone measurement of your kind of factual outcome of interest. Next slide, please. And so very quickly, um, I would just say that uh, without going into the details, there are techniques. COCA tries to leverage those assumptions to identify uh, the causal effect parameter on an additive model um, that's given the second bullet that the causal effect is constant across individuals. Then one could recreate uh, for different values of, of the causal parameter psi here, one could try to regenerate the potential outcome of nono treatment by verifying whether the, the, the parameter value uh, confirms the conditional independence that's encoded in, in the non the, the NCO assumption. And, and, and by, by such, one would then can then reason that the only and true value of psi that, that would satisfy this conditional independence assumption would be the causal effect. Uh, obviously, constant treatment effects are not a reasonable assumption, particularly if you have uh, binary or discrete outcomes. And so recently, we've generalized this to, to um, establish non-parametric assumption, which allows you to use any kind of outcome uh, 
uh, any scale of interest uh, and without imposing any restriction on observed data distribution, other than that you have a valid negative control and relevant negative control outcome. Uh, next slide, please. I think I'll, I'll maybe skip some of these conclusions. Um, the appeal of some of these methods, some of, a lot of them can be used using off the shelf software you, uh, you might be familiar with. Um, and I, um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Dr. Xi, who is now going to describe one of the methods that was in that table, which leverages both negative control exposure and negative control outcomes um, to uh, correct completely for confounding bias and explain those assumptions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will go ahead and turn it to Zoom. Thank you very much for the invitation. And I'll just jump into the content given the time limit. We'll talk about double negative control method and this extension called proximal causal learning. And I have the exact same acknowledgement that, that, as Eric because we work as a team. So a little background, um, previous pre uh, speakers have already given a pretty comprehensive review of the literature. And you'll see that most of the paper when we use negative controls in practice, we focus on detecting bias and validating the result. Once there's a non-null association found, people might not know what to do next. And for the very few paper that focus on estimation of the actual unmeasured confounding bias, they rely on relatively strong assumptions. And most of the methods utilize either a single negative control exposure NCE or a negative control outcome NCO. Now that motivates the double negative control method where double negative control means there we use one negative control exposure and one negative control outcome. And what's nice about the double negative control method is number one, it um, goes beyond bias detection or reduction and can completely remove confounding bias due to certain unmeasured confounders. And also for such a identification of unmeasured confounding bias, you don't need to pro uh, restrict your model. And so basically we call it non-parametric identification without any modeling restrictions. Uh, next slide, please. So in the next few slides, I'm going to give you the intuition behind the identification under a uh, double negative control method. And um, it will be under a toy example of linear additive model, although the actual non-parametric identification result does not rely on any modeling assumptions, which means it can be applied to continuous, discrete, or survival outcomes. Next one, please. Yeah, so here is a DAG that Eric just covered in the flu, uh, flu uh, vaccine example where treatment A is flu shot, outcome Y is mortality during flu season, and we're concerned about confounding bias due to health seeking behavior denoted by you. If you just, uh, and of course, we implicitly controlled for all the measured covariates X. Now, if you just look at the association between A and Y treatment and outcome, there are actually two causal pathways. The first one is the direct pathway from A to Y with a strong called alpha AY. Under linear additive model, that is exactly the true causal effect. However, on top of that, there's a spurious association from a hidden pathway, which we call a backdoor path, AUY. And the quantity, the magnitude of confounding bias is essentially a product of the UA association, gamma AU, and the UY association, beta UY. We can't directly estimate gamma and beta because we don't measure U. But the question is, can we leverage negative controls to un uncover the uh, magnitude of this product? So next one, please, next slide, please. Suppose we have access to mortality before flu season, which is a negative control outcome, W. By definition, flu shot does not have a direct pathway to W. So if I look at the association between A and W, instead of having two pathways, I only have one pathway, which is that hidden pathway that I'm concerned about, the AUW pathway. So the association between A and W would be gamma AU times beta UW. Now, if you compare the confounding bias and the AW association, they differ by the two blue arrows. If I'm really assume that health seeking behavior have the same amount of impact on mortality during flu season and before flu season, which means the two blue arrows, the two betas are equal to each other, then my problem is solved because I can use AW association to uncover the amount of magnitude of unmeasured confounding bias. So I can subtract off this confounding bias to get the true causal effect, which is alpha AY. Next slide, please. In practice, what this implies is you can just fit two regression models. You regress the true outcome on treatment adjust for covariates, and you regress the negative control outcome on treatment and of course adjust for covariates. Then the causal effect adjusting for unmeasured confounding bias would be the difference in coefficients of A from those two models. 
in the case where a negative control outcome is the baseline outcome, then this method is essentially the difference in differences method that's widely used in epidemiology. Next, one, next slide, please. Okay, here is a alternative. Suppose I have access to a negative control exposure. This is an example that Eric just talked about where we are interested in the causal effect of mother stress on baby's birth weight, and we measured father stress as a NCE, which is denoted as letter Z. Again, my goal is to uncover the magnitude of the hidden pathway through AUY, which is equal to gamma AU times beta UY. Now, by definition of a negative control exposure, it doesn't have a direct causal pathway or a direct impact on the outcome, which is baby's birth weight in this case, which means if I look at the association between Z and Y, there is only one pathway, which is Z, Z UY, and this association is equal to gamma Z U times beta UY. And if you compare the bias and the ZY association, the only difference is in the red arrow. So um, if um, now, if we're, you're willing to assume that the uh, family level factor has the same strength of association with both father stress and mother stress, then that means um, the problem is solved because the, the ZY association reflects the uh, amount of unmeasured confounding bias. So you can just regress the outcome on both treatment and negative control exposure to, and the difference in those two coefficients will be the causal effect. A special case of that is in air pollution studies as mentioned by Eric. Next slide, please. Now, what if the blue arrows are not equal to each other and the red arrows are not equal to each other? In this case, let's come back to the AW association. AW association is equal to gamma AU times beta UW. We previously said if the two blue arrows are the same, uh, life is perfect. But if they're not the same, we can't really directly identify them because U is not measured. But can we identify the ratio? In fact, the answer is yes. And that's why we need both negative control outcome and negative control exposure. Next slide, please. If I have access to negative control exposure, and let's look at ZY association and ZW association. For ZY association, my what I have is gamma ZU times beta UY, and ZW association, what I have is gamma ZU times beta UW. So they all go to, through the same shared arrow UZ, but it goes to UY and UW separately. So if I take the ratio between the two associations, I cancel out gamma ZU and I get back the scalar that allows me to scale up or down the AW association to match with the confounding bias that I'm interested in. To summarize, in a double negative control method, I use negative control outcome W to recover the bias, but up to a scale. And to understand what is that scalar, I will leverage negative control exposure and take the ratio to estimate that scalar. Now, if you look at the denominator, which is gamma ZU times beta UW, denominators can't be zero. And what that means is Z better be associated with U some, somehow and W better be associated with U. And this corresponds to a key criteria for identifying negative control, which says the negative controls needs to be informative or associated with the unmeasured confounder U. For example, if I just pick a zip code, zip codes are not associated with treatment or outcome of interest, but they're also not associated with the unmeasured confounder. So they don't bring in any information that allows me to uncover the underlying unmeasured confounding bias. So this is a very important assumption. You know, the beta and gamma can't be zero. Next slide, please. In the past five years, the double negative control method have evolved quite a bit, and we have extended the method to uh, discrete setting, continuous setting, survival outcome, and it also works for longitudinal data, mediation analysis, panel data, dynamic treatment regime, and test negative design. And for a long time, we thought we have always have to find negative control from secondary treatment or secondary outcomes. And recently, we figured out that you don't have to restrict yourself to secondary treatment outcomes. In fact, negative controls are readily available in the measured covariates, and that motivated the proximal causal inference method, which I'll cover re really quickly. Next slide, please. And next one. Thank you. So the motivating question for proximal causal learning is, are two cheap and noisy measures better than one expensive and accurate measure? The reason for thinking about that is because the no unmeasured confounding assumption, the key assumption in causal inference, it relies on investigators' ability to reduce the measurement error for covariates to exactly zero, which is very unlikely in practice. In practice, it's really hard to eliminate measurement error. And what you can do at best is to have covariates that you measured as proxies of the two underlying confounders. 
Now, what motivated us is to think about, although we can't eliminate error, measurement error, can we find or can we get to the right kind of measurement error, which allows us to adjust for measured and unmeasured confounding? So that motivated the proximal causal learning method. And I'm going to illustrate with a quick example. Next slide. <clears throat> So here's an example where we look at the adverse e effect of a new zoster vaccine on acute MI as a adverse event. The investigator measured age and sex as you know, traditional confounders. And in order to adjust for health seeking behavior, the investigator also measured dermatology visit and hypertension. The plan was to adjust for Z, X, and W altogether as measured covariates. Next slide, please. <laughs> Now, if you adjust for X, which it means that all the arrow coming in and out of X will disappear. Similarly, next slide, if you adjust for dermatology visit, you'll see that the, the arrows associated with it will disappear. And similarly, next slide, if you adjust for baseline hypertension, the blue arrows will disappear. Now I have adjust for, adjusted for all covariates. However, there's still one remaining hidden pathway, AUY, which means directly control for those confounders might not allow us to fully account for confounding bias. Next slide. <clears throat> now let's come back to the full picture. And next slide, please. What proximal causal learning does is the following. Instead of directly adjusting for all confounders, we're going to put them into three buckets. The first one is common cause of treatment and outcome, which is X, that's confounders. And the second one is treatment inducing confounding proxy, which is Z. Z is treatment inducing means uh, it in induced treatment, but it doesn't cause the outcome. So this satisfies the negative control exposure assumption. The third type is outcome inducing confounding proxy, which is hypertension. And it's not caused by the treatment and associated with unmeasured health seeking behavior. So this satisfies the negative control outcome assumption. Next slide, please. So proximal causal inference essentially use this idea of instead of treating all confounders equally, we're gonna divide them into three buckets and leverage different types of confounders to analyze and estimate the causal effect. And the key difference between causal, proximal causal learning and classical causal inference is in the identification formula called G formula. In classical uh, G formula, we estimate, we model the outcome and then marginalize over you know, the target population. Whereas in proximal G formula, you estimate something called a outcome confounding bridge function and then do the exact same thing. We have shown that if there is no unmeasured confounding, the proximal G formula reduces back to the classical causal inference identification formula, which means proximal causal inference is a generalization of classical methods. Next slide, please. Really quickly to summarize, number one, with double negative control method, you are, not only, you are no longer restricted to bias detection. And in fact, you can remove confounding bias, leveraging negative control outcome that recovers bias up to a scale and negative control exposure, which recovers that scale. And secondly, we can generalize double negative control method to proximal causal influence, which leverages the major covariates at hand and put them into three buckets, acknowledging that major covariates are in at back's proxy of confounders. So uh, with that, I think I am done. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sue. Next, we'll turn to Eric Comerfield. Hi, thanks. Um, so uh, there have been some questions about, um, you know, how can you statistically validate negative controls? Why do you have to make all these assumptions? So my talk will go into um, some of that. Uh, and this work include include uh, Shu also, who's been in involved in a lot of these projects. Um, uh, next slide. Um, so as people have been talking about so far, there's a lot of really powerful things you can do with negative controls. But you know, obviously, there's been there's some unhappiness about the issues with the assumptions, and that the ER estimates can be biased if these negative controls don't meet certain criteria. And these criteria involve causal relationships with the unmeasured confounder. How are you going to um, address that? Next slide. Um, so we've already seen this before, but in this case, I'm talking about something specific uh, that in our paper we call disconnected negative controls, where we're making an additional constraint where you're not allowed to have extra edges from your negative control exposure to your treatment or your negative control outcome to your outcome. This makes the negative control exposure, negative control outcome structurally actually very similar to each other because they just don't have any extra edges to anything at all. They're only downstream of the unmeasured confounder. Next slide. Um, so yeah, as I described, all the treks, so treks just a path without a collider on it. 
um, from a disconnected negative, negative control um, to the other disconnected negative controls, the exposure, the outcome, they all have to go through the unmeasured confounder. Next slide. Right. As I just described, those edges, all of these edges are actually gone. It's not just some of them, all of them are gone. Next slide. Um, so this is obviously much more restrictive than some of the negative controls that have been described so far. You know, why go you know, through the pain of making these extra conditions on ourselves? And the simple answer is that disconnective negative controls um, have some simple and very testable implications that we can use to verify them in the data. Um, here's the model that we've been seeing a lot just for reference. And the issue is that certain subcovariance matrices, certain little two by two pieces of, this, of the covariance matrix, you pull out those terms, these will be rank deficient if this is the true data generating process. So in this case, um, we've got sort of some notation here. If we look at the subcovariance matrix of W and Z by Y and A, that would have these covariances, covariance of W and Y, covariance W with A, covariance Z and Y, covariance Z and A. This is rank deficient. It has a determinant of zero. Right, and that's not too difficult to compute, right? We we calculate the product of the diagonal, the other product of the diagonal, and these will end up being the same. This is something that will be the case no matter what betas we put on any of these edges. Um, next slide. Um, the thing I just described, just testing that one rank deficiency, unfortunately doesn't do everything we want. And specifically, it wasn't going to rule out this edge from the negative control exposure to the negative control outcome. But that's something we can fix. Next slide. Um, by looking at more negative controls. So in this case, there's a simple model. We've got one edge that we don't want, the Z1 to Z2 edge. This edge is going to invalidate uh, our negative controls if we're not careful. But there are some triplets here that do meet all of our criteria. Z1, Z4, Z3. Those, that set of three variables don't have any direct edges between them. They satisfy everything that we've asked a di uh, disconnected ne negative controls to satisfy. All the treks to each other, all the treks from them to T, all the treks from them to O will all go through U. So U forms a choke point, and that means a whole bunch of um, these rank constraints are going to hold. Um, and in this case, there's since there's two different set of triplets that will work, and within those, we can use any pair that we want for the pairs of variables for double negative controls, for example. Uh, in this case, there'd be five different distinct pairs. Uh, next slide. So just quickly, there are six, if we have that situation before, there are six different things we want to test. To find if a set of three disconnected negative controls um, are valid disconnected negative controls, we want to do six different tests to determine if there are vanishing rank, um, rank constraints. Um, these are also called tetrads. Um, if the determinant is zero, we call it a vanishing tetrad. Um, there are tests, statistical tests for evaluating this, um, some of which are pretty old. So the Wishart test is a very old test for this. Um, we've had really good performance from it, which we'll see in some uh, simulations uh, in, in future slides. Um, next slide. Um, so as an example of the application of the test, we can confirm from this model um, that the Z2, Z4, um, and Z1T, that subcovariance matrix will not be rank deficient. Um, why is it not rank deficient? It's going to end up being not rank deficient specifically because of the extra edge from Z1 to Z2. There's sort of two sources of information that are producing covariance between Z2, Z1, and um, uh, Z2, uh, T, et cetera. And that means that this little two by two won't end up be having a determinant of zero. It's not rank deficient. And thus it won't pass one of our tests, one of our six tests. Um, it's actually gonna end up not passing more than one of them, but one is enough. Um, and so that's a, a way for us to determine that Z1, Z2, Z4, for example, is not a valid DNC triplet. Next slide. Um, Everything I described is basically proven from three assumptions. The first, just that the model is being generated from the kind of model we've been talking about. Uh, the second one being um, tetrad faithfulness. Um, this is something that, it, again, is going to basically be true in the infinite sample size. It might be wrong in finite sample size, but that's why we do some simulations to evaluate what kind of sample size you need for this to be reasonable. Um, 
And then the last assumption is this sort of linear and acyclicity below the measured variables. Uh, I think this can actually be relaxed quite a bit, um, but the, the current existing proof requires this. Um, so Benny, given these assumptions though, we can then say that um, our test will basically serve as a classifier for a set of three disconnected negative controls. Uh, next slide. Um, since we have a test, we can basically just do a brute force search through all the available disconnected negative controls. The scalability for this is not horrible because we're just doing this test on all sets, uh, subsets of three. So you have however many candidate negative controls choose three. It's not, not that bad. Um, next slide. Um, we did some evaluation of this, uh, implemented with the Wishart test that I already mentioned. Um, and for the couple of different models that we looked at, where we had a number of these extra edges that would invalidate um, some of the pairs of negative controls, um, the uh, sample size that we need to get really high performance is not that high. Um, by sample size, in this, in, for this particular model that this came from, sample size 100, we already have an AUC of almost one, for example. So we have very good performance even with relatively modest sample sizes. Uh, next slide. Um, and then using this process, um, we uh, developed a way to take a collection of all the different validated neg uh, disconnected negative controls um, and compute an aggregate um, estimate. Uh, next slide. Um, doing this, we find that, you know, because we have very good performance on identifying valid negative controls, we are able to um, learn a, the, the desired effect that we want to learn without um, any, any bias. Whereas if you used random negative controls, some of which are going to violate the assumptions that, we, that have been discussed, um, you know, you will end up being biased. That's sort of the blue in this case. Those are the just random pairs of negative controls. Uh, obviously, if you don't do any kind of negative controlling, it's even worse. That's this red, then you're sort of way off. Um, but as we go higher and higher, our green negative control pairs, the ones that were validated with our method, they stay on track and just have no bias in, um, introduced. Next. Um, so uh, what are the overall pros and cons of this kind of procedure I described? Some of the main cons are that um, you need DNC triplets for validation where you only need pairs for inference. Um, and the DNCs are also much more restrictive than other negative control types. So it's possible you're in a scenario where um, you have other types of negative controls that you can use, but if you use this procedure, you might find just nothing. None of the variables will pass the test to be disconnected negative controls when some other type of negative control will work. Those are some, you know, obviously some cons. On the pros though, we have actual statistical validation of the negative controls. So there's tests we can do to separate which negative controls seem legitimate based on the data itself, not requiring so much in terms of background assumptions. And that further, this can thus be automated onto a large set of candidate negative controls. And on top of that, this potentially identifies many valid negative controls. Uh, next slide, which is also good. Um, so in this case, we uh, have a paper with the dance algorithm that computes this aggregate of the estimates from the validated DNC triplets. But you know there could be other things that could be done as well um, when you have this large set of validated DNC triplets. Uh, next slide. Uh, thanks to my collaborators, uh, Xu and Jiwan Lim. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eric Comerfield. I'll turn it to our final presenters for this session, Patrick Ryan and Martine, please go right ahead. Great, thank you. I wanna th thank the organizers for inviting us to be able to come and present on this topic. And it's really excited to see the FDA putting focus on negative controls. Uh, on the next slide, please. So you've heard a lot today about this conceptual model that we're, we're talking about and using these, these variables to talk about uh, what it requires to have a negative control exposure or a negative control outcome. And we've been talking about how Z doesn't cause Y, how A doesn't cause W, and how uh, may, many of the methods you've been listening to thus far have focused on trying to find error due to unmeasured confounding U. Uh, 
in this presentation, I'm going to talk more generally about the desire for us to find systematic error in our methods. And so I'm just going to introduce C here as the measured confounder that we also want to be able to address. Next, please. The uh, reason I want to juxtapose that conceptual model to our real-world problem that uh, our colleagues at the FDA and those in industry and academia are facing is when we're doing real analysis of real healthcare data from administrative claims or electronic health record data, we don't have the luxury of having just a problem of a Z and an X and a U and a C. Um, but actually, we've got a pretty complex problem uh, ranging from having healthcare data about individuals that contain demographics, conditions, drugs, procedures, measurements, uh, and that's a very high dimensional space. Next slide. And within our data sources, not all of those baseline characteristics are measured. So we can think of unmeasured features as something that could vary by database. So some data sources may not report race and ethnicity. Some databases may not capture signs and symptoms. Over-the-counter medications may not be captured or laboratory values may not be available in a given source. So most data sources we're dealing with have some unmeasured features um, that we would like to have in an analysis. But even still, we're left with measured features that can scale into the tens of thousands of different baseline characteristics. And some of those unmeasured features may be indirectly measured, which might actually have an appealing characteristic, which is that they may be correlated with the things that we actually can directly observe. Next, please. Now, what I want to highlight here is that when we talk about confounding, what we're talking about is the relationship between one of these, one of amongst these 10,000 variables is related to treatment and outcome. Uh, and those could be the observed confounders, which I'm denoting here in yellow, or the unobserved confounders being those variables related to treatment and outcome, but are not actually measured in the data source. And so we can think of that DAG actually expressed as a very large dimensional space that we want to explore. Next slide. Now, the basic assumption that we're trying to make is where we want to know that our methods for estimation are giving us unbiased estimators, and we're trying to develop negative controls so that we can actually verify that we are producing unbiased estimates. So whether we're interested in a negative control exposure related to the outcome of interest, or a negative control outcome that follows uh, the treatment of interest, or this idea of double negative, uh, negative exposures and negative outcomes, we're still predicated on this idea that in this high dimensional space, we're presuming that we can adjust for all of the observed confounding, and that we presume that all of those unmeasured confounders have the same structure. Uh, next, please. And I would assert that it would be really, really great if we could find negative controls that satisfy all of these assumptions. But this is just practically challenging because the full con confounding structure in real data across all baseline covariates is extremely difficult to determine. And the likelihood that we're going to find some negative control that has the exact same confounding structure is pretty low, given the complexity of the real world problem. Next slide. So. I want to try to make an argument that maybe we can still learn quite a lot by relaxing some of these basic assumptions. And I'm going to do this by, by providing two thought experiments for you. So what if we had a negative control that we believed had no confounding? That is, there were we believed that there was no yellows and no oranges on that large dimensional space. If we applied our estimation method to that case where we thought there was no confounding and yet still produced some sort of biased estimate, wouldn't we be concerned about our target estimate? That, that is to say, if we observe bias where we didn't expect there to be some, we'd probably be worried about our approach. Uh, next, please. The other extreme would be to imagine that you could select some sort of negative control that had even more confounding than the target uh, outcome of interest. Uh, and if it were the case that you applied your estimation method in the presence of some sort of negative control exposure outcome relationship, where there was extreme confounding, and yet still your estimation uh, method produced an unbiased estimate, you may actually take that as reassurance that your estimation method actually has approached. So given that we can relax this assumption about the exact confounding structure and still learn something from either of these extremes, um, what I'll present is how we, how we in the Odyssey community have been thinking about using negative controls as proxies for helping us with detection and calibration of error. Next slide. So given that this com complex structure is inherently un unknowable uh, and can vary tremendously between any given negative control pair we pick, uh, 
what we have been focused on is the idea of not just trying to select one particular negative control that has an exact structure, but trying to embrace the idea that we can select a sample of uh, a large set of negative controls, recognize that each one may have a different confounding structure, but should hopefully have some sort of uh, uh, related and similar confounding structure that we can benefit from. So if we focus on negative control exposures to the target outcome of interest, or take our treatment of interest and look at negative control outcomes, we can examine that there may be some similarity to the confounding structure, but also differences that we can hopefully learn from. And if we select a large enough set of these negative controls, uh, we may be able to learn from that entire collection. Next slide. So uh, yeah, estimating the error across this range of confounding structures, we believe uh, can provide us some general understanding of the residual error that we might be expected for our estimation method of interest. Next, please. So this is um, this idea that we want to go from just one negative control to selecting a large sample. It's predicated on the idea that we have some mechanism for identifying sets of negative controls. And if it's possible for us to relax, relax this assumption that requires identical uh, confounding for unmeasured variables, then that means that the primary consideration we have is can we find negative control exposures that are truly not uh, causing the outcome of interest Y? Or can we find negative control outcomes that are not caused by the target uh, treatment of interest A? And so there, if we want to identify candidate negative controls, we're basically just looking for exposure outcome relationships that have no existing evidence of a true causal effect. And within the Odyssey community, we've been focused on trying to do this empirically by verifying that there is no evidence in the published literature by using PubMed abstracts and, and mesh indexing, by examining the FDA approved product labels to identify that the outcome is neither indicated for the drug nor in the warnings and precautions section nor in the adverse reaction section, and also using the spontaneous adverse event reporting data to verify that we don't have some sort of existing observed safety signal that can be detected from disproportionality analysis. Now, clearly the assumption we're making here is that absence of evidence means that there's no evidence of, of, of absence. And we know that that's not true, but as a starting point, this can serve as a useful proxy. And within the Odyssey community, we've developed a, an approach to identify this candidate set of negative controls by bringing this information together and making publicly available open source software that then can allow producing a list of negative controls that can undergo manual review. Now, the assumption that you have to make here is that all the negative control exposure outcome pairs have some true relative risk of one, which we're going to use to be able to observe error. Um, but we've, we've recognized that since that's an unknowable assumption, we want to understand the tolerance of this approach in a given set of negative controls. And uh, Martine led important work that showed that indeed, that even if you pick a large set of negative controls and that ass assumption that the true relative risk is one may be violated in some circumstances, uh, it's still the case uh, that we can produce a, a valid error distribution. Next slide. So given that we could have a set of negative controls that may have a relaxed uh, uh, set of assumptions about confounding structure, the question is, what can we do with them? And I would assert that there's two, um, uh, two primary use cases that we'd like to describe and motivate the potential use of negative controls. The first is diagnostics. We want to simply be able to determine if our estimation method has some sort of residual error. Under the premise that if we don't observe error, that's reassuring that our estimation may be useful. And if we do observe error, then we can actually question the fundamental basis of our study, question whether we've used the appropriate design, decide whether we want to stop, or maybe potentially choose not to unblind our results. The second use case is calibration. We want to actually be able to have the opportunity to correct our methods estimates for residual error. So given that we can estimate error, we'd like to be able to understand whether or not the statistical estimators that we produce from our method, can they truly reflect the uncertainty that's represented not just by the random variation that we're typically accustomed to doing, but also by whatever systematic error is observed. Next slide. So I'm going to go through a couple thought uh, uh, thought experiments for you to think about why we think this approach to, to large sets of negative controls is useful. If you had only one negative control and you conducted your estimation method and it produced a relative risk of one with some confidence intervals of, say, 0.5 to 2.2, uh, one could see that no evidence of error was observed using your negative control. But the question is, is this sufficient evidence to trust your estimate of interest? Next, please. <clears throat> 
In contrast, if you had one negative control and it produced an effect estimate of five with some wide confidence interval from like two to 11, then there you would have observed a large statistically significant uh, error. And this raises the question, is this sufficient evidence to disregard the estimate of interest? And next, please. And the answer is it's not so straightforward. It's probably the case that having one negative control that shows no estimates is reassuring. And it's probably the case that having one negative control show a large effect uh, is, is worrisome. Um, however, those negative control estimates themselves have uncertainty. And we have to wonder whether we actually feel that we can uh, uh, satisfy an exchangeability assumption associated with that negative control to our target question of interest. And it can get actually much more complicated if you click next, please. We can have negative controls that produce some sort of estimate like this, a relative risk of two with a confidence interval from 0.9 to 4.4, where it hasn't definitively said there's no error and it hasn't given you reassurance that there's, there's um, a large significant effect. And then we're left in this question of what do we do now? And as Zafar presented in his literature review, there's lots of papers using negative controls. And what I find quite striking is the use of negative controls whereby some error is observed. And then we have to decide what do we do in the face of knowing that there's some error in the real world that was examined. Next, please. So how can we use a large set of negative controls to help as a diagnostic? What I'm showing you on the left-hand side, uh, I'm sorry, could you go back well, one slide? Oh, I see. Uh, I'm sorry. Go, I'm sorry. Go forward. Thank you. Um, so uh, on the left hand plot here, I'm showing you a series of negative controls, not just one dot, but a series of them for two different estimation methods. And what's actually notable here is that uh, in each of these examples, there's an example where there's a negative control estimate of one and there's an example where it's a statistically significant effect. And yet by having this distribution, we can start to understand whether or not that distribution represents a collection of error that we can learn from. And we can see that in this case, method one has a constellation of negative control estimates that suggest that there are no, is no significant substantial bias. Whereas in method two, you can see that the uh, negative control dots that are represented there are showing this consistent positive bias. And so an objective diagnostic that we could consider would be some sort of predefined threshold to say, how much error do you observe before you're willing to trust that you're producing a valid estimate? And within the Odyssey community, we've been evaluating different objective diagnostics to provide rules that one could follow, including using the expected absolute systematic error as one metric that one could derive from this distribution. Next slide. Um, so one could think about the way to interpret this is if you had your estimate, estimate of interest and it's a relative risk of 1.5 with a confidence interval from 1.2 to 1.8, do you trust that answer? And if you had applied method one, you may say, yes, I trust that answer because that es estimate is farly, far away from that cloud of estimates from our negative controls. But in contrast with method two, we could see that we could expect to observe that nominally statistically significant effect in, even if there was no true effect to be observed. And so as a diagnostic, understanding whether or not you can trust your result before you look at it is one powerful use of negative controls. Next slide. The other use case we can have is to think about uh, calibration. So if our methods are actually estimating uh, the random, uh, the, our, our ty typical methods are estimating random error only. What we can use our negative controls to do is to actually estimate the magnitude and the uncertainty of the systematic error. So when we talk about calibration, what we're really just talking about is how do you integrate the systematic error into your uh, estimation statistics, whether that be your point estimate, your confidence interval, or your p-value. And so the idea is if a diagnostics is simply giving you a go, no go, should you interpret this estimate, what you can do with calibration is actually say, what is should the estimate be in face of the error? Uh, next, please. So if we look at method one, that uncalibrated estimate was 1.5. We said that it passed an objective diagnostic. We thought that we didn't see so much error. And indeed, if we were to calibrate this estimate, we see that the estimate doesn't move very much. We now get a point estimate of 1.6 and a confidence interval from 1.2 to 2.0, meaning from a regulatory decision-making perspective, we wouldn't change any interpretation of this result because in the face of very little systematic error, we can have confidence in our study. Uh, next, please. 
In contrast, if we applied method two, where we observe substantial systematic error, we may have failed in objective diagnostics. What calibration says is we need to incorporate that error into our estimate. And here you can see that estimate of 1.5. Uh, now we have to both shift the point estimate down to 1.1 and, and widen our confidence interval to now be a range of 0 0.7 to 1.7, reflecting the uncertainty that comes with that systematic error. So our assertion is that by using a collection of negative controls, we can quantify the systematic error and we can use that systematic error to decide whether or not we actually want to trust the estimates we produce and potentially calibrate them down to produce statistical estimators that we can uh, restore their operating characteristics. Next slide. So just to, to, to conclude, um, our... Uh, our premise about this medium that I'm really excited about is we believe that we need to do better in terms of trying to handle confounding and other sources of systematic error. The challenge with modeling confounding in the real world of our healthcare data is that it's tremendously complex and high dimensional. And so finding negative controls that satisfy these strict modeling assumptions with certainty is particularly challenging. And even if we could find one, it may be insufficient for supporting decision making. Uh, we believe that identifying negative control exposure and outcome pairs that can be assumed to have no causal relationship. That's actually a reasonable and tractable problem. And that having those, even if we relax those assumptions about confounding, uh, can help us estimate systematic error, both from observed and unobserved confounding. And we think that having this idea of a large set of negative controls can really provide a much richer corpus to understand the performance of a method, uh, because now we can actually estimate a full error distribution, which can then be used both for making decisions as a pre-specified objective diagnostics, or by calibrating our estimates to restore their operating characteristics. So with that, I'll stop and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, and thank you to all of our session two presenters. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that uh, as we continue to cover a range of complex information in this short amount of time, uh, a recording of this workshop will be available on the Duke Margolis event webpage in about three to five business days. Um, so uh, with that reminder, we'll go ahead and turn to our short discussion to close out this session. Uh, another reminder, uh, audience members can feel free to submit questions through our Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom window. And again, some of our presenters and panelists here uh, may respond to those questions via that same Q&A function. Now, I'd like to um, turn it back to our uh, presenters for session two. Uh, we have some, some questions we'd like to ask you all. Um, first, I want to know what you all think uh, in terms of uh, potential trade-offs when using data-driven approaches. So in your experience and, and based on everything that you've presented today, what are the potential trade-offs when using data-driven approaches uh, such that many negative controls and automated modeling are leveraged as opposed to identifying and defining a select number of negative controls. I'll open it up to the group, whoever would like to uh, go first. And I'm happy to repeat that question if need be. I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um... So I, I think, you know, I, 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 I hope everyone would agree that in like all causal inference methods with observational data, there are, you have to put in some assumptions. And so the data-driven approach um, has to encode certain assumptions that allows it to work from the data. Um, it, it, what I mean by that is that you have many potential negative control variables and you have to encode certain assumptions. So you might encode the assumptions that you're willing to assume that at least one of them is valid and you search for that one. You assume, you might assume that 50% of, of them might be valid and you encode that knowledge, but you have to encode something and develop methods based on that, that assumptions. Um, and so you, there's an extreme, there's a whole range of assuming, you know, absolutely nothing, in which case you can't get anything out of the data. Um, to assuming that you know everything, in which case the data will just tell you what you think you already know. Um, and so uh, maybe I'll, I'll feed this thought to other people. Thanks, Eric. Any additional thoughts uh, from our panelists? I'm, I'm happy to repeat the question. What are potential trade-offs when using data-driven approaches where many negative controls and automated modeling are used or leveraged 
uh, versus or as opposed to identifying and defining a select number of negative controls. Well, I, um, I think we heard another alternative, right? So, so we either pick one or two that, that we think we are hard about, where strong assumptions are needed, then either we use a data-driven approach such as Dan's, and as Eric pointed out, you need some strong assumptions there. And then um, I guess we're so, so, sort of in the middle with selecting a large set of negative controls, but then um, acknowledging that we have to uh, basically let go of some of these assumptions that we, we basically are uncertain about the, uh, the confounding structure. So um, <laughs> I have my preferences there, um, but uh, yeah, to X point, these all have, have strong assumptions. And, and my preference would be to have methods that actually acknowledge that we are uncertain about these assumptions rather than keep on making strong assumptions that we can't prove. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I saw another person um, attempt to answer the question. Yeah, so in terms of trade-offs, so I mean, one thing is obviously what types of um, data you have access to, you need to have something that's very high dimensional so that you could have access to many different candidate negative controls um, and uh, and make use of those. So this is obviously a limitation on the type of data that you have. Um, you're also going to be spending less time and effort probably per individual negative control when you have a large amount of them. That's going to be more difficult to do sort of the human level um you know involvement with subject matter experts that sort of thing to look at each negative control and 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 think about it at you know as an individual negative control what it's um uh, what its strengths might be compared to if you have a smaller number of negative controls um and then obviously if you have a larger set of negative controls you have more chances to have some good negative controls in there you don't have all your eggs in one basket so to speak um and that has uh, a number of its own advantages um, so at least those are some of the trade-offs that uh, occur to me uh, off the top of my head. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Zoo, unless you have any other thoughts, we can go to our next question. Thank you, Rachel. Eric covered, uh, both Eric's covered my points. Wonderful. All right, I'll go to our uh, next question for you all. Um, generally speaking, how might you characterize strengths and limitations of these approaches for identifying unmeasured bias and confounding. Whoever would like to go first. So um, I can go first. <laughs> I guess I'm eager. Um, so I, I think that's an interesting question. Um, so one common approach to deal with unmeasured confounding is to do sensitivity analyses. Um, I think there was a slide there that mentioned something like e-values. Um, what these methods um, do is sort of anchor your inferences elsewhere. So sensitivity analysis will typically say, suppose I have this much on measure confounding, how could I use it to identify causal effect? Um, and, and that that knowledge is often um, not available. Uh, the degree of measure confounding you might have is not something that you can learn from the data, nor expert, regardless of how much it is claimed that expert can inform you on that. Um, negative control anchor your inferences elsewhere. It, it, it might say, for instance, that if you have temporal restrictions and you have certain, that, that will impose certain null effects, that the outcome cannot be affected by future treatment. Um, you might want to use that knowledge. It's anchoring that as something that you've already, you can either logically assert or you have prior scientific knowledge about. That also allows you to anchor your sensitivity analysis as elsewhere. I think Mar Martin mentioned that if you have uncertainty about the validity of your negative controls, you could also conduct a sensitivity analysis that is anchored are the negative control assumptions. And so I think my perspective on this is that it enriches our space of options. Um, the different methods, um, and the, my own view on this is that we, we ought to try to triangulate our inferences, try several methods. If they roughly agree, that's, we learn something. If they completely disagree, we learn something. We can't trust any of them uh, necessarily without additional assumptions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Any additional thoughts from our panelists? 
I'll uh, repeat the question once more. Uh, how might you characterize the strengths and limitations of these approaches that we've discussed for identifying unmeasured bias and confounding? Uh, I'll chime in, Rachel, just, just to say, I, I think uh, I'm really glad that we're having this, this workshop because while there may be differences in the merits of these different approaches, I don't think anybody's suggesting that the differences between those are better than the counterfactual, which is what we currently do in epidemiology, which is effectively hope that we don't have confounding and, and uh, assert some sort of trust in the estimates we produce. I think whether, whether or not you take a model-based assumption to draw out your DAG and hope that you know the confounding structure or that you take an empirical approach, both of these are just trying to provide supplemental information to try to strengthen your confidence in the estimate that you're actually trying to study. And so I think that there's, there's high merit in us trying to think about how do we impose additional rigor into our studies to try to provide this supplemental information that can just strengthen our beliefs in what we can observe, and I, my personal opinion would be like the more, the more, uh, the more we can build confidence in our estimates, the more we can kind of uh, break down the the typical concerns that get raised with real world evidence when people just say ah, it's a biased estimate, we shouldn't trust it at all. You got to do a trial. I think that the work that's been presented in in this workshop is kind of demonstrating that there's more we can be doing if we impose rigor to to start to verify that the estimates we produce can be credible. Thank you, Patrick. Um, any additional thoughts from our panelists before we uh, proceed to our next question? Eric, go right yeah, ahead. Yeah, um, one, one other thought was for um, identifying, specifically for identifying, discovering if there is unmeasured confounding, right? A lot of the stuff we've looked at is kind of assuming unmeasured confounding is already present, right? And we're trying to address this issue where we think it's plausible. Um, I don't know about negative controls directly, but I mean, there are other uh, tests and some of which would involve things like negative controls that have, again, certain kinds of testable assumptions. Um, if there are other variables causing your treatment, other variables causing your outcome, this is gonna have testable signature um, if there is an unmeasured variable versus if there is not for the treatment and outcome. Um, so there's certainly approaches to do that and all these approaches involve having extra variables, um, which will generally, you know, count as some kind of negative control. There's some of the questions about, um, right, there's a variable that's not connected to the unmeasured confounder. Is that really a negative control? It's brought up, you know, instrumental, instrumental variables could be considered counter, right? All of these are going to have extra signature going through the treatment and outcome to the unmeasured variable if there is one. So I don't think we've discussed any ways of doing that directly, but there are such ways of using these extra variables to do that. Thank you. All right, great. Um, we have a question uh, from one of our audience members uh, regarding negative control uh, outcomes. So there is appeal to multiple NCOs. We assume that each NCO is measured with high accuracy. In practical settings, it is often quite a lift to establish that the primary outcome of interest is measured accurately. Now, this is magnified by the number of NCOs. Uh, depending on the misclassification misclassification mechanisms, one can easily produce a null association or a, non, a random non-differential or a more extreme finding, often in the setting of a differential uh, MC. Any practical thoughts around this uh, scenario? I'll turn it to our panelists. This is a question from one of our audience members. Well, I, I, I mean, I would, I would say that like any other analysis, if your measurement, the less useful a measurement will be, the more, if it's noisy. Um, so there, there really is no cure to having really, really, really noisy outcomes. Um, as the panelist, as the, uh, the person mentioned that you know it would bias you towards no association. Um, the, the only thing that I would say is that um, this, this, as Shu mentioned, this idea of, of proxies, of thinking of negative control variables as proxies, acknowledges, it, it explicitly acknowledges the fact that variables, not just the outcome, but confounders, especially confounders, are often measured with error. 
Um, and while acknowledging that uncertainty in your measurements, um, it, it tries to correct for it. Now, even those methods uh, require that your proxies are sufficiently good proxies. What that, does that mean? It means if your outcome varies a little bit or your measure confounder varies a little bit, you will have corresponding variation in your proxy. Um, and so that's, that's a, a form of relevance. Um, and so I don't think anyone would argue against the fact that if you have too much noise, you're not gonna learn much from your data um, without putting in a lot of very strong assumptions. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, Go right ahead, Eric, come well, up here. Yeah, also, I think that this, um, this question applies to certain negative control methods and not others. Um, for example, I don't think that having some noise in the measurement of your um, negative controls has as much impact if they're the disconnected negative controls and this double negative control type of approach where you're look, you're really your focus is really on these pathways and learning the strengths of these pathways that go through the unmeasured confounder instead of trying to use the negative control itself as a direct stand-in for the confounder, right? So I think that for certain uses, this may be a concern, but for other uses, especially the ones where we're using multiple negative controls and really emphasizing the pathways that are being taken and learning these betas, as you know, Shu described, um, uh, I don't think those actually suffer from this so much. If you have obviously more noise in your measurement, you'd expect your these pathways to be weaker, noisier perhaps in the estimate. Um, and so maybe you want higher sample size to, to be get better convergence, but um, I think at the end of the day, it's not bias inducing. Um, I don't know, Shu or uh, Eric can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I also, also think this scenario argues for why you need multiple negative controls, right? Because if your one negative control outcome doesn't have the same measurement error as your outcome of interest, then then you're in trouble if that's the, you're going to use that one negative control outcome to adjust your uh, your estimates, whereas if you have more, not saying that that magically solves the problem, but that at least uh, allows you to get a get a range. Um, I also think like negative controls are very good at at uh, measuring un, or, or finding unmeasured confounding, but measurement error. I think also you need other techniques to, for example, establish the operating characteristics of your your the sensitivity and specificity of your outcomes. So I think. There, there also needs to be a separate approach to that specific problem. Yeah, and I also wanted to add that, you know, when we use negative controls in practice, there are quite a lot of, you know, um, practical um, criteria that we look at. For example, for negative control outcomes, you don't want it to be too rare, right? It's better, it better be have at least the same amount of number of events as the outcome of interest. And the negative controls might, they better be strongly associated with treatment and outcome due to this spurious association under, you know, with that underlying um, pathway. So there are those criteria to check um, with measurement error, they won't pass some of those criteria. Thanks everyone. Um, I do have one more question that we'd like to get to from our audience um, and following, um, following you all's comments. Um, uh, an audience member asked, how do you pick up the negative controls for an outcome or exposure? Is there any rule of thumb or is it based on the assumption that the negative control exposure is not linked to the outcome and the negative control outcome is not causally related to the exposure? Are there any validated resources for these negative controls, especially for administrative data? If anyone would like to quickly answer that question before we turn to our break. So, so as Patrick mentioned, we have a we have a software tool that generates candidate list of negative controls, but in reality, it, it has to be currently still a human in the loop that that reviews those negative controls and and thinks through the whole causal structure. Yeah, and if you're willing to use the disconnected negative control, uh, I think the dance algorithm has R codes that should be publicly available as well. Um, although you know um, to validate those um, negative controls. The, the gold standard is subject matter knowledge. Um, and um, the table that Eric showed allows you to check you know, whether your variable satisfy one of the DAG that encodes the negative control assumptions uh, based on subject matter knowledge. Thank you both. 
All right, and unless we have any other comments from our panelists, I think we can go ahead and turn to our scheduled break. Uh, we will take a break until 12.45 p.m. Eastern, so we would love to see everyone rejoin us at that time following this uh, lunch break that we've uh, included in today's event. We look forward to seeing you all back here at 12.45 p.m. Eastern to begin our next session, which is entitled Utilizing Negative Controls in Safety and Effectiveness, Methods Development and Key Considerations. So we'll see you all back in a few minutes. Uh, welcome back, everyone, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. We're, again, really glad to have all of you with us today and have appreciated the, the lively discussion so far. This afternoon, we have some more topics to follow up on where your participation, questions, and comments are very important, so please continue to use the Q&A um, uh, function. Um, the... Um, uh, let me just, uh, sorry, just getting a, a note from the team. Um, so just uh, start by introducing myself. For those who I, who I don't know, I'm Mark McClellan, the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy here at Duke University. We are, really appreciate this opportunity to work with FDA and all of you on such an important topic for observational analysis. I'm also an independent director at Lyman Healthcare, Cigna, and Johnson & Johnson, and very pleased to be with you to moderate this important next session on utilizing negative controls in safety and effectiveness, methods development, and key considerations. In this session, we're going to hear about FDA's initial planning efforts and their proposed approach for advancing methodological demonstration projects as required and specified in the PDUFA 7 commitment letter. The demonstration project aims here include to develop an empirical method to automate the negative control identification process in Sentinel and integrate it into the Sentinel system tools. You're going to hear how that's built on the discussion that we had in the earlier sessions. And second, to develop a method to use de double negative control adjustments to reduce unmeasured confounding in studying effectiveness of vaccine. So some pilot efforts in, in that regard. Following these two presentations, the uh, panelists that we have for this session will provide some perspectives and feedback on the FDA proposals and consider how these projects might further advance the effective use of negative controls in the Sentinel initiative and more broadly in supporting regulatory decision making. So I'd like to ask our panelists and presenters to turn on their cameras. As they do that, I'll introduce the panel. Uh, first, Richard Weiss is associate, sorry, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical, Medical School and, and uh, the Associate Prof, uh, Epidemiologist in the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics at Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard University. Yoon Liu is a mathematical scientist and real-world evidence reviewer within the Office of Biostatistics and Pharmacovigilance and part of the Analytics and Benefit Risk Assessment Team at the FDA in the Biologic Center. Rohini Hernandez is Director of Observational Research in the Center for Observational Research at Amgen. Joss Ganni is Vice President and Global Head of Epidemiology within the Office of the Chief Medical Officer at Johnson & Johnson. And Susan Gruber at Putnam Data Sciences is co-founder of TL Revolution and the founder of Putnam Data Sciences. Um, last and not least, Daniel Morales is Senior Clinical Epidemiologist within the Data Analytics Task Force at the European Medicines Agency. So we'll hear from all of them. And I'll start with turning to our speakers for the opening presentations, and that begins with uh, Richie. So can I turn to you? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, good. I guess good afternoon now, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me to um, share a little bit about this project on automated negative control identification. Um, so I should mention before jumping into the slides here that this project is actually going to be led by Xu Shi, um, who presented earlier. Uh, she was a biostatistician at the University of Michigan who works on methods for identifying and using negative controls and causal inference, um, including the development, um, her with uh, collaborative work with Eric. Um, in the, developing the tool that will be the focus of um, this project. And so um, since Shu presented earlier on this topic, I was asked to step in and give an over, overview here. All right, so next slide. Uh, next slide. 
All right, so just to give a very quick background, I know that several of the earlier presentations um, today have already given an in-depth background on negative control. So here I'll be very brief. Um, this project was really motivated by a focus to identify bias in studies relevant in the Sentinel setting drug safety, um, compounding and of course other hidden biases, um, of course always being the primary obstacle to establishing validity and always a challenge. Uh, next slide. Uh, so using negative controls to identify biases has been around for decades. Um, it's really not a new idea, um, but in recent years, they've started, they've really started to gain traction. And there have been a lot of, you know, several groups that have come up with very clever variations of identifying and using negative controls to identify bias and even calibrate estimated effects in observational studies. And so some of these with actual applications to empirical examples um, were discussed in the earlier presentations uh, today. And so I think everyone here is already familiar with the definition of a negative control, um, that being a variable that is associated with unmeasured confounders, um, but not causally related to the treatment um, in the case of negative control outcomes, or not causally related to the outcome in the case of negative control exposures. Um, so next slide. So the problem um, or challenge that this project is trying to address is the identification of negative controls, really this being obviously the first step in using these tools. So traditionally negative control variables have been identified manually um, using expert background knowledge. Um, investigators going through lists of variables and try to determine to the best of their knowledge if the variable qualifies as a negative control. Um, and this of course uh, can and has worked very well in many, in many studies. Um, but it can have limitations, um, particularly in settings relevant to Sentinel, where little can be known. Um, you know, little is often known about a new drug that comes onto the market, and investigators need to rapidly perform many analyses. And so, it's in these settings that data-driven tools um, can be very useful here. Um, not necessarily to replace manual selection of negative controls. Um, you know, expert background knowledge is always going to be useful but to supplement expert selection of negative controls where little background <coughs> information is known. So recently, Xu Shi, um, who again is leading this project, uh, along with Eric, developed an automated or statistical test to identifying negative controls that they call DANCE, uh, which stands for Data uh, Driven Automated Negative Control Estimation. Uh, next slide. All right, so DANCE, um, so Eric really gave a nice presentation on this earlier. Uh, so I'll be very brief here. Uh, so DANCE foc focuses on the identification of negative controls of a special type, as Eric explained earlier in more detail, um, called disconnected negative controls. And so a disconnected negative control is a variable that is not causally related to the treatment or the outcome, but is of course associated with the unmeasured um, confounders or confounding. So this type of a negative control is more restrictive than the general definition of negative controls, which can be related, um, or in general negative controls can be related to one of the treatment or the outcome. So I'm going to skip over again the technical details of the DANCE algorithm, um, since this was discussed in details earlier. Um, just a very high level overview is that the algorithm looks at the joint correlation matrix between the candidate negative control exposures and outcomes with observed exposure and outcomes and to see if this matrix is, is ranked efficient. So that's as, about as far as I'll go into any sort of um, explanation of what DANCE um, does, since that's not the purpose of this presentation. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So this algorithm has already been developed um, and published with a theoretical foundation to build on. Um, so the purpose of this project is to integrate the DANCE algorithm within the Sentinel toolkit, toolkit um, that can eventually be used and deployed. Um, to do this, the DANCE algorithm needs to be tested and adapted to settings reflective of Sentinel da data environments. Uh, next slide. Next slide. So this project, um, so this project is really divided into three phases. Um, phase one is a research phase where we will be developing large scale plasma simulations using linked claims EHR data that we have available here at Brigham and Women's um, to test the scalability and adapt the dance algorithm to data reflective of Sentinel settings. Um, specifically settings involving tens of thousands of variables that can potentially be evaluated as possible disconnected negative controls. So plasma simulations are a common tool used in pharmacoepidemiology to evaluate the performance of methods. Um, they use real empirical data and we'll be using these um, plasma simulations to simulate true disconnected negative controls as a function of real empirical baseline covariates from studies that we will generate. 
And then we can evaluate the performance of dance in settings that approximate the complex of real world data. Of course, um, the settings won't perfectly approximate that complexity, but um, try to get close to simulate that kind of complexity as close as possible. Let's see, next slide. So the focus of these plasma simulations um, will primarily be on assessing the computational scalability of the algorithm in high dimensional settings so that we can modify and adapt the algorithm and develop code to optimize computational performance. Um, so in other words, the goal here is to adapt and tailor the dance tool to the unique challenges of complex large healthcare databases. Uh, next slide. So in this research phase one, um, we will be constructing plasmode simulations using EHR data from the Mass General Brigham Research Patient Data Repository, um, which is the largest healthcare provider in Massachusetts. Um, this data will be linked to Medicare claims, providing a linked EHR claims um, data structure. Using this linked EHR claims data, we will then generate cohort studies, which will then be used then to create the plasmode simulated data sets. Next slide. So this slide shows a couple of example cohorts um, from the linked EHR claims data that we will be using that we have already that we already have available that we've used in other projects. So these are not necessarily the studies that we will be using for this specific project to create the plasma simulations, but it just gives an idea of the um, kind of general data structure or the types of the types of studies that we will be using. Um, for the plasma simulation, specifically in terms of the sample size, so thousands, um, potentially tens of thousands of observations and high dimensional covariates, um, tens of thousands of covariates that can potentially be evaluated as disconnected negative controls. Uh, next slide. All right, so this is the last slide um, that summarizes the three phases of the overall project. Um, phase one, um, which I've, I've really already focused on here, again, takes the real empirical cohorts, um, creates plasma data sets that we can then evaluate performance of dance and adapt code, um, which we initially, this will initially be developed in R, um, the R software and made publicly available. In phase two, we will then be evaluating and resolving implementation glitches or issues when applying the software on actual Sentinel data with the Sentinel common data model. Um, the goal here is to make prototypes ready for deployment in future, future Sentinel queries. Um, and then finally in phase three, the objective is to have fully quality check codes with documentation that can be deployed across Sentinel data partners. And so a big part of this last phase um, is going to be translating the developed R packages into SAS computer modules um, so that the tools can be deployed across um, the Sentinel data partners, which many still primarily uh, use SAS computer software. And so I think that gives a pretty um, good high level overview of the project um, that we'll be working on. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so that, that's it. Uh, thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks very much, Richard. And next is Yun Lu. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yun Lu. I'm from FDA Cyber. So today I'm going to present um, my third development proposal using double negative control adjustment to reduce American funding in real world vaccine effectiveness studies. Next, please. This is my disclaimer. Next, please. Real world evidence and real world data have been increasingly used to answer scientific and regulatory questions. It's important to enhance the capabilities to use RWE and RWD for regulatory decision making. Next, please. Non interventional studies are often used to assess real world vaccine safety and effectiveness. The real world data reflect exposure and outcome experiences during routine clinical practice. And the subjects included in the studies, they have a wider range of health conditions than in randomized controlled trials. For vaccine real world safety and effect studies, we often have millions of individuals. So the large data set provides enough power to detect small but clinically relevant differences and analyze rare outcomes. However, increasing sample size will not reduce bias. It's very important to minimize bias in the design, conduct, and analysis stage. Next, please. In 2021, FDA has published four RWE-related draft guidance documents. Next, please. Electronic health record and claims data 
are often used in vaccine safety and effectiveness studies. The draft guidance mentioned that in general, EHR and the microclinics data do not systematically capture immunizations offered in the workplace. In addition to immunization at the workplace, multiple factors could result in underreporting of vaccination status. Next, please. Many of us are familiar with the COVID-19 mass vaccination site. During the early stage of the COVID-19 um, rollout, insurance information may not be collected. So that could result in underreporting of COVID-19 vaccination status. Next, please. So when we conduct real-world vaccine safety and effectiveness studies, it's very important to understand the data well and identify potential sources of bias. Underreporting of vaccination status is one example of variable mislocation. So the COVID-19 vaccines received at mass vaccination site, influenza vaccinations received at the workplace, all contribute to underreporting of vaccination status and resulting exposure mislocation. In addition to that, some low-cost vaccines. Uh, for low-cost vaccines, um, some beneficiaries may decide to pay out-of-pocket, and then the claims data may not be able to capture the vaccination status. And for health outcomes, in order to capture the health outcome in the claims data, a person needs to seek health care. So health seeking behavior could be a potential confounding. Because when we compare vaccinated and the unvaccinated individuals, vaccinated individuals, they may tend to seek healthcare more often. The COVID-19 pandemic also impacted housing behavior over time. So the housing behavior could be a time varying confound as well. And how to control for housing behavior can be a challenge in the vaccine safety and effectiveness studies using real world data. Next, please. In the Padova 7 commitment letter, as you mentioned, two method development projects. And one of them is to develop a method to use a double negative control adjustment to reduce unmarried confounding in studying effectiveness of vaccines. Next, please. Xu Shi has already presented a double negative control method um, in the morning, so I will not repeat all the details. Here I'm borrowing her slides from her September 2018 presentation. That was when we first heard about this double negative approach at FDA CBER. And at that time, we just published a paper a year ago using 13 falsification outcomes for Zoster vaccine effect studies. And we were at that time also working on another project for Zoster vaccine effect studies is linking MCBS that Dr. Um, Hector Zorita just uh, mentioned this morning. Uh, at that time, we saw that, well, this method was really relevant to the vaccine effect studies that our team are working on because the 13 policy outcomes we're using they're not directly affected by the source of vaccination. Basically, they are negative control outcomes. Next, please. Uh, because I'm a statistician, so I will have to show a formula. Again, I borrowed this formula from Xu's September 2018 presentation. So the idea of double negative control is to use negative control pairs next to control exposure Z and next to control outcome W. So two models will be fit. The first model is regress outcome Y on treatment A and negative control exposure Z. And the second model will regress negative control outcome W on treatment A and negative control exposure Z. And then 
um, will provide bias adjustment by using the negative control pairs. So this morning, uh, Dr. Israelita, he presented a slide showing some uh, coefficients using the full skin outcomes or negative control outcomes. So he basically also fit the two models, but without negative control exposure. So our team has been using negative control outcomes to detect potential bias due to American funding. So this double negative control adjustment is a natural extension to the work we have been doing because we'll be using the negative control pairs and do bias adjustment. Next, please. So this proposed vaccine effectiveness study using double negative control approach will build upon our experiences using real world data to conduct vaccine effectiveness studies. So our data source could be the medical claims data, for example, Medicare insurance claims data, which covers a vast majority of individuals 65 years older. And for this proposed study, we would like to minimize source of biases other than American funding. So we want to choose herpes zoster vaccine because herpes zoster vaccine was not offered at workplace or mass vaccination site. And also the vaccine is relatively expensive. So it's very rare that a beneficiary will pay out of pocket. So the exposure itself is really likely captured in claims data. And for outcome, we'll consider three outcomes, herpes zoster, hospitalized herpes zoster, and also more severe outcome, post-herpetic neuralgia, what we call PHN. Again, those outcomes can um, also reliably captured in claims data, and also they have different um, disease severity. Next, please. So we'll think about confounders. There are major confounders and unmatched confounders. Medicare claims data could capture many variables, for example, individual level characteristics. So we can control them in the study. And for the unmatched confounder, here we we'll consider health seeking behavior. So as I mentioned earlier, vaccine individuals may tend to seek health care more often the unvaccinated individuals that could introduce bias. And also health skin behavior tend to impact mild and moderate health outcomes more. So here we have um, different outcomes with different severity levels. So we'll um, want to see what is the impact of the housing be behavior on different health outcomes. Next, please. So we would like to control for mild confounder. So we're going to use the standardized mean difference to determine the cohort balance of coverage. And we're also going to use propensity score weighting. So inverse probability of treatment weighting will be used to address imbalance in all measured variants. We'll also be applying a doubly robust approach. So we include all coverage in both the propensity score and outcome model. Next, please. So for this uh, method development project, as I uh, mentioned before, we would like to minimize the bias other than um, American funding, and also how to select a pr appropriate negative control exposure and negative control outcomes are very critical. Because both the negative control exposure and negative control outcome, they need to be associated with health skin behavior. And the negative control exposure does not directly affect the zoster outcome. And the negative control outcome is not directly affected by the herpes zoster vaccines. A presentation earlier today already mentioned um, different approaches to identify um, negative controls. For example, um, Dr. Rishi Weiss before me, he mentioned the automatic method. And in the morning, Dr. Hector Zureta also mentioned that some predefined um, negative controls based on um, the prior knowledge. And for this study, because we have 
outcomes with different disease severity. So it's also important to consider like control outcomes with different disease severity. So they will have um, similar associations with the uh, marriage confounding uh, health seeking behavior. So here we're just uh, presenting um, the proposal and the idea of how to uh, make the master development project. But at the same time, we are also open to the suggestions from the audience and uh, the panelists because we want to work together to advance this field and want to um, work together to minimize the bias when we use real world data. Yeah, uh, that's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks, Yun Lu and Richard, for teeing up this discussion. Again, we're first going to hear from panelists. We definitely want to hear from those of you who are everyone who's joining us today. So uh, next, I'd like to turn to Rohini. Thank you. Um, so first, I'd just like to say thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm very excited to participate in this panel. Um, I'd also like to give my disclaimer that the, the views I'll present are you know, mine based on my experiences and, and not necessarily represent uh, the views of, of my employer. Um, so, you know, just, just to start off with, I was, I was very excited to hear about the two demonstration projects that are being proposed today. Um, I think like many others have mentioned, you know, I, I believe there is a lot of promise for negative controls to help us understand um, you know, the extent of bias that, that may be present in some of our causal inference studies, and then, you know, potentially as a tool to adjust for this bias. Um, I'll say, you know, from, from my experience, I've done a lot of work in therapeutic areas and on medications indicated for patients with very severe disease. So, you know, for example, patients with sort of late stage oncology um, uh, uh, conditions in which maybe they've failed multiple prior lines of therapy, and I think, you know, particularly in these types of cases, the, the underlying confounding um, by disease, disease severity can be very, um, you know, can be very uh, severe and in, in some cases maybe even intractable. So again, I think negative controls are a great um, tool to help us understand that. Um, you know, just a few comments I wanted to make and sort of comments and, and sort of questions on, on the demonstration projects, you know, as, as you know, the concepts that have been proposed today. I think one comment is that both of the demonstration projects seem, you know, they're, they're primarily focused on the adjustment of our effect estimates of interest using these different methods. Um, and as we heard earlier today, you know, this is definitely an area that needs to be further developed. And, and most of the publications thus far have been really focused on using negative controls as a diagnostic tool. Um, but I am curious to, to hear if that sort of diagnostic component might be incorporated into the two demonstration projects. So for example, you know, have, have the investigators considered some sort of gated or phased approach in which first the negative controls are used as, as that kind of detection tool. Um, and in, in my experience, that's kind of the approach that, that we've been, you know, trying to move forward is, is first using negative controls as a diagnostic and you know, taking the time maybe to iterate on your study design, your inclusion exclusion criteria, maybe your choice of your comparator group um, based on what you find from that negative control sort of assessment. And then, you know, maybe reevaluating your negative controls again and see, have you improved, you know, your extent of bias um, or, you know, reduced the extent of bias. Um, so, you know, and if that sort of phased or gated approach sort of makes sense, what would be the decision criteria that would tell you, okay, you have, um, you know, reduced your bias enough that you may move forward to your second phase of your study in which you're actually estimating your causal contrast of interest and, and perhaps, you know, using one of these uh, really exciting sort of bias adjustment methods to adjust your effect estimate of interest. Um, so I guess kind of big picture, that was one of my first sort of comments or questions was, was, is negative controls as a diagnostic part of these two demonstration projects, sort of the first part. Um, we've heard, you know, others today, and Dr. Liu, you mentioned in, in your talk, sort of the, the approach of negative control selection of automation versus sort of subject matter expertise. And we've heard others say today that, you know, they're perhaps a combination of the two is, is, is a good approach. And, you know, that's just something I was also thinking about as, as I listened to the demonstration projects and, 
you know, can we use sort of that expert panel, you know, type of Delphi approach to validate the negative controls that are selected via the automation methods? Um, I think that would definitely provide, you know, a, a lot of additional confidence. Um, and then just the third comment I wanted to make was related to uh, Dr. Weiss, your pre presentation on the dance algorithm. Um, and I really was excited about that plasmode simulation approach. I think it's a great approach. Um, and you mentioned that the two examples um, that were provided are sort of, you know, potential examples um, or potential scenarios that might be tested and, and other ones might be considered. And I was specifically wondering um, about uh, some scenarios, you know, in which, again, as I described earlier, we might expect that underlying confounding by severity to be, you know, very, you know, you know, uh, very large. So, you know, would you consider a study of a, a biologic versus an oral medication, you know, something like that, where you might need a new switcher design? Um, so, and, and, you know, maybe studies of safety as well as studies of effectiveness, which I think I, I saw represented on the two scenarios you presented. Um, so I think I just want to, so I think I'll leave it at that with my opening remarks and just say, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about hearing about these demonstration projects and, and look forward to um, continued conversation. Great, uh, thank, thanks very much for the comments, uh, Rohini. And next I'll go to Josh. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. And thank you to Duke Margolis, the whole team for organizing this meeting on a really important topic and one that I'm particularly excited to be learning more about. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to share my thoughts with this panel. Um, I wanna congratulate FDA for embarking on this journey with negative controls uh, and also to Drs. Liu and Weiss for really nice presentations of a couple of really interesting projects. Uh, much of what Dr. Hernandez just says really resonated with a lot of what uh, what I wanted to comment on. So I'll do my best to be additive and highlight some of what, what she just said as well. So as I reflect on the presentations by Drs. Liu and Weiss, um, as well as on the presentations and discussions from earlier in the day, it's really exciting to see just how much innovation is happening in the space of negative controls. Um, we now have multiple approaches to identify negative control candidates. Uh, and we also have multiple approaches for utilizing negative controls, either as a diagnostic for bias or potentially also to correct bias. I would say that this is one of the most exciting and most promising areas of methodological development in pharmacoepi today. So it's uh, really great that we're here today to share learnings and figure out how we move this forward together. We routinely use multiple negative controls in some of the work that we do at Johnson & Johnson. Um, I've been at Johnson & Johnson for almost two years and was in academia for about a decade before that. And in my academic work, I was increasingly seeking to use kind of single one-off negative controls um, as a, a form of bias detection in some of the work that I was doing. And it's always a challenge to identify and justify a single negative control given the assumptions of negative controls as we've, um, as we've heard about today and the difficulty in empirically verifying those assumptions. I think a fundamental question that FDA will need to address is how do we arrive at a set of potential negative control outcomes for a given study that we can be confident in? And this has been discussed throughout the day so far today. The dance algorithm that uh, Dr. Shi has uh, proposed and others have proposed in that uh, the project that Dr. Weiss presented on is, is one really promising approach, which uses the study database to empirically identify potential negative control candidates. We also heard earlier about an empirical approach that uses information external to the study database to identify potential candidates. And we heard as well about using directed acyclic graphs and subject matter knowledge to, um, to identify negative controls. Both Dr. Chechkin, Chechkin and Dr. Weiss have already made this point, but I think a key question will be not which of these approaches we use, but how do we use them in concert to triangulate on a set of potential negative control candidates? And I think the, the dance algorithm will be an important step in that direction. I think that every study that is conducted without using a set of potential negative controls uh, today in 2023, at least to empirically detect bias is potentially leaving a lot on the table. Uh, I think the assumptions of negative controls are not terribly dissimilar from some of the severe assumptions that we actually already make in selecting a comparison group for any real world safety or effectiveness study. That is in, in every study we make an assumption that conditional on the measured confounders that we're adjusting for, our comparison group needs to adequately capture the remaining unmeasured confounding. Um, and so I actually view negative controls very much as a way to 
test drive those important assumptions that we're already making before we move forward with a decision to move on to the estimation stage. And just as I wouldn't purchase a car without test driving it, I, I would want a set of negative controls to help me understand whether the results of a real world evidence study are likely to be robust and reliable before we move forward with that estimation step. With all that said, I do have a, a couple of comments on the specific proposals. Um, and I think one conceptual question I have is around the negative control exposure uh, introduced with the double negative control framework. Uh, and the specific question is, if we have a valid disconnective negative control exposure, is it better to incorporate that variable into the double negative control estimation framework? Or is it actually better to simply use that negative control as an active comparator, much like we do in many of our active comparator studies? It seems to me that if the variable meets the disconnected negative control exposure assumptions, then it is also an ideal active comparator. And if used as an active comparator, it would actually in and of itself resolve confounding, both measured and unmeasured, without the need for additional negative controls. Um, so I think it might be interesting for, for us as a community to consider whether a comparison of the double negative control framework to a more traditional active comparator approach would um, potentially with negative control outcomes um, could be, uh, could be a, a um, viable alternative and how do those kind of compare head to head. I think one opportunity from the NICE simulation study that Dr. Weiss proposed uh, to sort of stress test the dance algorithm is to consider scenarios beyond those which uh, fully meet the assumptions of the disconnected negative controls. Um, so thinking about scenarios in which, uh, which, in which the assumptions are uh, maybe partly but not fully met um, and then going back to the triangulation idea, uh, I think an interesting next step might then be to examine the concordance between the candidate negative controls that are identified by the dance algorithm and potentially uh, those identified by expert judgment as well as those identified by empirically um, using empirical sources outside of the study database. So looking forward to more discussion, really looking forward to the advances that these projects are gonna make and, uh, and thank you again for these important proposals. Uh, thank you for the very helpful comments. And next, I'd uh, like to go to Susan. Hi, um, thank you for having me today. And I echo the comments of the other panelists that this whole negative control approach sounds very promising. And I'm especially attracted by the dance algorithm because if we can find um, disconnected controls that that meet that stringent criteria that I think it inspires more confidence you know the the subject matter might have might have directed our attention towards them and then we have some statistical data driven um proof quote unquote proof to back up that you know these these are the real deal and so if the dance algorithm doesn't identify a sufficient number of disconnected negative controls we're not really any worse off and if it does it seems to me it uh, greatly improves our confidence in the whole endeavor. Um, but having said that, I tend to focus on the actual, like how do we do this best and well? And so I have, I have questions and maybe suggestions for things to be explored in the simulation studies. But, but I do have questions though. And, and, and one is the whole um, dance algorithm, as I understand it, is um, it rests on the, on these statistical tests, wh whichever one you end up using. And so my question is, you, uh, uh, you can fail to reject the null because the variance is very large rather than because there is no actual effect. And so it has to do with power. And when you're in a safety situation, my question is, are we gonna end up identifying some some uh, you know uh, ostensible negative controls we're going to call them that but they're, they're really not it's just that there was low power to detect the covariance deviating from zero in the first place and again is that especially important in a safety study and i don't know the answer maybe sue if you know the answer or eric do you want to respond now i don't want to put you on the spot we can also uh, have them, I mean, uh, how about if I uh, ask uh, uh, each of our presenters to maybe respond briefly once we're th through the comments, and if there are any particular, there, there were some that were directed back to you from your earlier panelists too, um, and if there are any that you feel like you can respond to now, that's great, uh, but again, 
this is really a meeting about getting all of this information and considerations on the table so FDA can take it back as they consider how to move forward. So maybe we could handle it that way, but it's a really oh. good question, Susan. Okay, thank you. Then I have another one. Um, we actually are interested in just four things, right? Those Delta, the Delta AY, the Delta ZY, Delta ZW, and Delta AW that we saw on the um, in the second presentation in this session. So um, I would argue that equating those with coefficients in a main terms regression model might be shooting ourselves in the foot. It's really important to get those things right. And um, I would suggest using machine learning to really learn those. And, and because I come from this TMLE background, I would even target the estimate of those. But even if you don't want to target the estimate, allowing for potential interactions and nonlinearities might be um, a key to success. And then my final um, thing that I think could, could be in the hands of the, the people running these simulation projects is that I wonder what will happen when we have sort of not perfect U comparability. Um, what if the unmeasured confounding factors for the negative controls, the actual ones are a superset of the unmeasured factors, uh, you know, affecting our treatment and outcome of interest. And in that case, is there going to be any harm would you would you um, incorrectly adjust for a so-called bias that was really due to a, a different set of unmeasured confounders? And so having that be in the plasma simulations to really understand what happens in these different cir circumstances would be helpful to me. Um, because what my my ultimate question is, <laughs> It's, it seems it's very attractive to say, let's always specify some negative controls to use in analysis and let's always use them. And I'm wondering if we do that, would we ever be harmed? And, and so I would try to understand the circumstances under which that could be harmful. And I'm not sure that we would be. And I'm wondering if, if we would and, and could the plasma simulations maybe illuminate that. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Great, some, uh, some great comments, and I, I would like to at least give the panelists an opportunity to come back to them and a few of the others that have already been raised uh, on the, the proposed um, uh, next step projects. But let me first go to Daniel. Yeah, no, thank you very much. Um, again, I, I echo many of the, the comments that made by the panelists already. I think, you know, negative controls, why are they potentially a good thing? Well, we know that EHR databases and real-world databases are increasing in size. And then precision was traditionally our safeguard from some of the issues of bias, and that's no longer the case. So we do need better methods uh, to, to safeguard from, from the issues of bias, or at least to identify our potential correct. So um, it, one of the aspects of uh, you know, negative controls is you know, they, they will need to be well selected and pretty robust, particularly uh, to inform decision making. And it was really great to see the automated approaches, but also what Richard is saying is that it's not to replace clinical review, it's to augment clinical review, because fundamentally I think there will be still a role to do that. Um, so with identifying a negative control, we want to sort of move beyond um, just identifying them based on a clinical opinion without validation to really trying to establish some proof of absence of an association uh, with the negative control. And I think it's important to, to remember that Potentially all principles of epidemiology apply to the identification and use of the negative controls as what they would do to other variables of interest. So I think when we're looking at trying to identify these negative controls, we have to bear in mind the data quality, uh, the potential for missing data, um, sample size, and potentially even whether there is an impact on uh, database heterogeneity when we're trying to identify these um, as to, to whether we would get difference and whether a set of negative controls is uh, appropriate for one database or, or can be used across all databases irrespective of um, its um, background. And I think, um, I think the, you know, it would be wonderful to uh, identify a, a large number of disconnected negative controls. Um, but often these things aren't black and white. So I'm quite interested in Number one, the frequency of how often these could be identified, but also the strength, uh, similar to what we would 
think about an instrumental variable um, as well. And that may also have an impact on, on uh, detection of bias and also how well you may be able to correct for some of these things. Um, and then lastly, uh, I think, you know, similar to what's been echoed uh, by other panelists is what do you do if you identify some degree of bias, um, you know, with the use of negative controls? Do you stop and abandon the study? Do you review the design and see if a better design can improve things? Or do you use it to, to correct the unmeasured confounding issues? So I think th that aspect of, of how we utilize it probably needs to be uh, you know, very explicit as well. Um, and maybe not assume that it's all just an, an unmeasured confounding uh, uh, that can be easily corrected by. So I think I'll probably stop there just now and uh, interesting to hear other thoughts. So great uh, comments from all of you. Thanks very much for, for really helping to enrich the session. That was the goal. And again, I'd like to encourage uh, uh, questions or, or comments from everyone who is attending today as well. I've had some good ones come in about the methods and about how they're being used in FDA so far. But uh, any questions and comments about these next steps? So these are the next steps that FDA is going to take to try to advance the effective use of these methods. Um, let me uh, start this by, as, as, I, as I said, I would, um, asking for any um, follow-up requests um, from our uh, presenters, from either Richie or Yoon, about the comments they heard. There were another a number kind of directed to uh, um, that are relevant to uh, formulating these two uh, initial studies. Um, things like uh, using uh, negative controls to help refine an actual evaluation um, not uh, versus um, uh, using them in assessing how to do that evaluation. Um, Josh's question about a valid uh, negative control exposure as an active comparator. Susan's question about underpowered uh, potentially um, uh, invalid uh, negative controls that look like they may be um, a negative controls but, but aren't powered. Um, any comments on any of these questions? I know it's going to be very helpful for FDA to take all these back to the further planning. So I'll just um, comment briefly on a couple of points that I think were made um, by Josh and Susan both. <clears throat> so before, um, so this project um, that I talked about, it's it's before, you know, um, it was mentioned, you know, we have these different phases that you can use negative controls for. First to identify bias, and then to, once you identify bias, then what do you do? You use the negative controls to then calibrate results. Um, so there's the different things you can do with negative controls. That's not really what this first project is concerned with. Um, this first project is simply concerned with, before we get to all of that, just identify negative controls. How best can we identify negative controls, large numbers of negative controls? I think ideally, if we could, um, it's I, I compare it to confounder selection. You know, we could we could draw our causal diagrams, and ideally, just use expert background knowledge to define everything. That's not practical in large healthcare database studies. Um, you know, of course, we're never going to get rid of expert background knowledge um, for causal inference. That's always going to be necessary. But can we supplement background knowledge with automated, data-driven tools, machine learning? to improve our analyses. Um, we certainly can do that with confounder selection. I think that's widely accepted now. And I think that we can do that with identification of negative controls. And that's what this first project is about is um, we supplement the expert knowledge to identify um, negative controls with automated procedures. And we build on that and um, try to see how best we can integrate those two approaches to identify a collection of negative controls. Um, I think there's certainly limitations with both Susan Obviously, if you're doing fully data-driven approaches based on statistical tests, there's limitations with power. Um, and that's where the integration with expert background knowledge comes in. You know, you can have manual review of some, um, you know, automated tools that I've identified a subset of variables to make the set, you know, a reasonable um, set of variables that could be manually reviewed and et cetera. But I think it's important to emphasize the, the combination of the two, I think, is the way forward in um, this, this endeavor. Great. Uh, I think, thanks very much for, for those comments. Uh, Yoon, anything you'd like to add at this point? Yes. Um, so I would um, also want to comment on some of the questions. The first question is about when we um, using the double negative control approach, whether we're going to consider using the negative controls to detect potential bias. The answer is yes, because when we run the double 
energy control approach, we're going to feed two models. The first model is to regress Y on treatment A, as well as the negative control exposure Z. And if we detect that the coefficient associated with Z actually is not zero, that indicates there may be potential um, confining. And also another model we're going to feed is regress negative control outcome on the treatment and negative control exposure. So if we also detect that there is the coefficient is not zero for treatment, which also indicate there's potential um, confounding. So basically the first step, yes, we'll be able to detect whether there's potential source bias. And also uh, when we um, use the phosphation outcomes uh, for Zoster vaccine studies, we use the 13 instead of only one, because sometimes the coefficient could happen to be non-zero by chance. So we want to see systematically if there's any systematic deviation from zero when we um, look at all the all negative controls. And to answer the question about um, uh, when we run the model, whether we consider like a linear or non-linear relationship. Uh, so yes, for the formula I copied, um, actually it's a very simple linear model. But when we do the vaccine effect studies, actually first uh, we use generalized linear model because the outcome is binary. Second, we also consider interaction terms. We also consider non-linear relationship. For example, uh, sometimes we would apply splines to the co if it covariate. So basic the answer is yes. We allow for interaction terms. We allow for non-linear uh, relationships. And also we use the generalized linear model to allow for uh, outcomes that are not uh, normally distributed. Yeah. Um, so I will stop here. Thank okay, you. thanks. Uh, well, there may be some more opportunities for discussion coming up, but uh, trying to um, get as many uh, questions and topics in as I can. Um, I would like now, I expect our panelists may have some further follow-ups on these, and I want you to try to incorporate that in the rest of our discussion, but I want to broaden this uh, a little bit um, based on some of the questions that we're getting from uh, those of us who are joining us today, and please keep sending those in. Um, one of these questions was about, uh, I'll take it to mean how these new steps, these new studies uh, as part of Sentinel fit into the existing FDA efforts around providing more guidance and clarity on um, developing better, more confident evidence, as you all are just saying, using observational data on regulatory questions. So the specific question was, are there any FDA guidance documents uh, or other uh, guidance on negative controls? And I'm not asking you to do an exhaustive review of you know, the four RWE guidances that came out last year, but just a sense of, um, I guess a better question, maybe a, a broader way of framing it is, um, what is this building on in terms of existing FDA guidance, regulatory tools and supports for getting at the key issue of causal inference in observational data, and um, how uh, are these methods uh, going to be an important improvement, or how could they be an important improvement on those existing uh, guidances? Anyone want to take that? And um, then I'm going to go to, to Rich in a minute if, uh, uh, if there aren't any takers, but... Uh... Maybe I can start. So I think that um, a key question that we all face is, how do we assess the robustness and reliability of real-world evidence? Um, it's so critical to advancing the use of real-world evidence for causal inference. And I very much see, just like we have a toolbox full of tools, that actually Eric Jushkin, Jushkin mentioned, we have sensitivity analyses, we have different methodological approaches, whether they're between person designs or self-controlled designs that rely on different sets of assumptions. And we can do analyses across multiple databases, all to sort of kick the tires on real world evidence that we generate to understand our level of confidence. I think that negative controls in some variety should be part of that toolbox, right? And I think that we should be thinking about getting to that point where there can be explicit guidance through some of the regulatory guidance documents on what a, an approach uh, would be that's acceptable to FDA. I think today we've opened up a whole lot of important questions from how do we identify negative controls to once we've identified them and used them for detection, what do we do as, as uh, Dr. Rolali said, do we stop or do we correct or do we do something else? Um, and so I think those questions are important ones, but I also think that 
we are at the point where negative controls are useful for at least getting us to the point of what do we do next if we do use them to detect some bias. Yeah, and, and uh, Rich, maybe I could go to you next, but it, it, it does sound like from what I'm hearing from these comments that, you know, while there's a lot of uh, potential here, and I also appreciate one of the comments in the chat, you know, for the first rule of pharmacal epi uh, epidemiology, it's sort of like I, I grew up doing uh, econometrics, all of observational data too, you don't get some, there, there's no free lunch, I have to make an assumption somewhere that's going to have consequences, and those are very important to uh, understand better. Um, so it does seem like at this stage, with all of the, the suggestions in this session around not just trying to get to, you know, a toolbox of like, how do you actually incorporate these in a uh, negative, uh, um, negative controls in a final um, study, including um, uh, double negative controls, uh, how to use them to maybe uh, augment, assess the design of the study itself, maybe think about, hey, maybe there's some larger sources of unmeasured uh, um, bias of various types that are contributing to refine the study. So I can see tools across a range of areas. Um, Rich, I appreciate your coming on for some comments at this point. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much, Mark. I, I wanted to respond to the question about uh, guidance for negative controls. Um, I'll just say that I'm I'm not aware of any guidance on on negative controls that that has come out uh, so far. I'm pretty sure that that we do not have uh, guidance in that area. I, I think um, in many ways, the meeting today um, is the, uh, the start of the process of uh, learning more about how to use negative controls in the FDA framework. As um, uh, Hector and Yun pointed out, we have some limited experience in CBER, at least of using negative controls in previous uh, projects. Uh, but I think we have to do a lot more work before we're at a stage where we can be uh, issuing draft guidance uh, on this point. Um, but that's why we're here at this meeting. That's why we're doing the pilot projects is to start uh, building the experience that we need in order to um, uh, in, in order to start using these uh, more regularly um, in FDA. So thank you. Great, thanks very much. And any other comments from the panelists on this topic? I wanna to move to a related one. Okay, great discussion. I'll go to uh, one of the other open questions from um, our um, the, from those who have joined us today um, is uh, uh, kind of going to this point is, boy, it would be nice to have uh, um, um, practical tools or, or steps you could take for assessing potential negative controls for um, regulatory relevant research questions, uh, the, the comment specifically on Odyssey, and I don't know if one of our Odyssey experts wants to, to, to type an answer in there if, uh, if you all want to address that too. But I guess more generally, um, you know, you want to get to the point where there are tools in the, the, the toolbox. And to Rich's point, if we're just at a kind of an early stage of um, uh, getting from here to there, do you see any gaps? And you've talked about some, but do you see, are there any other gaps that you'd like to bring up um, about what the proposed projects that FDA can undertake could help move forward on that? Um, any other important gaps to, between where we are now uh, and the, the tools that we'd like to see developed and validated over time that aren't going to be necessarily addressed by the um, studies that we've described so far and some of the modifications that you all propose. Uh, well, I will start um, because this is a massive development force. So we are using the Johnson vaccine as an example. But in reality, there is no one size fits all solution because the potential sort of biases are specific to the specific studies. And also when the population changes, the magnitude of bias could also differ. For example, we're talking about health seeking behavior. That is more common in communal dwelling. But if you look at nursing home residents, then they're less impacted by health seeking behavior because um, they're, the healthcare is more readily accessible. And we also have observed that 
when we conduct vaccine effectiveness study and safety studies, as well as the natural history study. Um, I will show you one example. So we were evaluating long COVID, post-COVID condition. And when we look at commercial dwelling Medicare beneficiary versus nursing home residents, we have noticed that among people with post-COVID condition, 19% of commercial dwelling without a prior COVID diagnosis code. But for the nursing home residents, only 5% of them are without a prior COVID infection code. Intuitively, we would say that for any person got diagnosed with post-COVID condition, they should have a prior COVID diagnosis. So that illustrates the potential impact of health-seeking behavior on the two populations. So basically, um, when we use real-world data to conduct safety and effectiveness studies, we really need to understand the data well, understand the population, understand the potential source of biases. So in, so in summary, there's no one size fits all solution. So when we develop this method using a specific example, it may not apply to other studies, but the principles apply. We'll use the same principle, try to minimize bias in the design analysis conduct stage. But then we'll need to work together so we can use automatic methods, but at the same time also need to uh, collaborate and apply the knowledge that we have gathered from the real world effect in studies. Yeah, thank you. No, thank, thanks, you. I appreciate that comment. It also raises the further point that, well, you know, there are a number of issues that are going to arise in the vaccine studies and the, the principles, the approach may be relevant to others. Um, but as FDA is thinking about supporting next steps in this area, what are some other types of pilots? You know, is there a typology out there, uh, other types of applications that would be good to include because they raise somewhat different issues? Um, but any other comments from the, the group on this uh, on this question? Well, maybe a, a couple of things I could add, in. and definitely I, I appreciated what you said about, you know, everything is, is so situation dependent, depends on your population, your data, you know, really understanding, you know, treatment, you know, practices and things like that. And, and that just made me think, you know, can negative controls change over time, right? So as, you know, maybe a drug has been on the market for several years, we're doing some kind of long-term safety study, for example, you know, prescribing patterns change, maybe the channeling bias changes, you know, the, the types of patients who receive the drug change, and, and that can affect, you know, the appropriate negative control selection. So just wondering if there's any, you know, anything there maybe to incorporate sort of, sort of temporal trends in, in negative control selection. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, and then Dr. McClellan, I think you mentioned also, you know, what else might we consider in these, you um, demonstration projects. And I was thinking about, again, sort of negative controls as a diagnostic tool. And, and you know, I hear that these projects sort of incorporate that as well, but is there some type of decision criteria like, that we could come to say, you know, this is, you know, an acceptable negative control relationship. You know, there's, there's not, you know, minimal evidence of bias. And so we can move forward to our causal estimate of interest. So is there some way to kind of pinpoint what that criteria might be. Yeah, a very important uh, component or dimension of tools that can hopefully come out of this eventually. Yeah. Uh, any other comments on this? Uh, great discussion. Um, let me go to a uh, related question. It was in the same general topic of potential gaps that you might want to build into the design of these initial uh, projects from Paul Copeland, um, who uh, talks about submitting articles to journals using native controls um, uh, and p-value calibration, where um, uh, Paul says that reviewers haven't questioned the use of negative controls, but has question, have questioned the use of p-value calibration, especially when a safety finding was noted, but after the p-value calibration no longer met the predefined decision criteria to be considered a safety signal. Um, any comments from the group on whether these proposed projects um, will provide some insights about how to validate the p-value calibration methods? Uh, in, in Paul's example, that was in a safety study, maybe this applies to effectiveness studies uh, as well. I guess I can start the ball rolling. Um, several years ago, Eric Tech and Tech and I published a paper 
responding to the p-value calibration paper and we pointed out that um, the p-value calibration seemed to be very successful at addressing the the problems with the type one error rates which um, means that that you fail to reject the null hypothesis when you should you want that to be five percent of the time but it actually had a very um, kind of disastrous effect on the type two error rate, which is what this person is, is alluding to, that, that you have a, a true safety signal and now suddenly it looks not significant anymore. And, and that's just what happens when you do p-value calibration. Um, and so if you're in a setting, say you're in a drug development setting and you've got many candidates that seem to be effective, it might be great to winnow those down using p-value calibration to ones that survive that and then move forward with the most fruitful candidates. But when you have safety signals and you're going to start to rule out the vast majority of them, the one that survived through p-value calibration will be true signals, but you'll have also just excluded a whole bunch of true signals. And so I saw that as, as a danger of that approach. Um, I, I don't know how to remediate it, but I, I can say that we have a, a in the paper, we we verify that this is a, a true problem that happens. And, and we'll be interesting to think more about how these of these methods might might help address some of those um, issues too. Um, uh, so this this actually brings up another topic that I wanted to ask about um, in terms of um, these early applications or early development um, studies focusing on safety um, versus uh, effectiveness um, studies that could be done using the Sentinel or other um, observational data for, for regulatory purposes. And oversimplify the Sentinel history a lot. I would say that it started out early focusing on safety and even then focusing on confirmation of, of, of signals have been generated elsewhere. Now that's expanded out already. Um, would say that from the discussions and presentations today, a lot, and I expect because of some of the high level of interest in this meeting, um, there's a, a lot of activity going on related to effectiveness questions, you know, not just um, uh, detecting uh, uh, important, if, if fairly rare, safety signals. Um, as these projects go forward, um, are there any special considerations for studying safety versus effectiveness questions and any thoughts on on how much effectiveness is going to be a part of this uh activity from the start maybe i can offer one perspective which is that i think methodologically i don't see any difference in the approaches whether the um, health outcome of interest is a safety versus effectiveness outcome but i do think that we should be thoughtful about the tenability of the assumptions of negative controls when particular health outcomes are anticipated um, versus unanticipated. I think in the cases where we're talking about anticipated events, sometimes benefits, the size of the U, the unmeasured confounding may be larger than in situations where we have an unanticipated event. And so that would be my only kind of watch out, but I'd be curious in, uh, about others' opinions about whether the methods would differ, which they don't seem that they would. The methods or the practical studies that should be undertaken now to move this uh, this, this field forward. Yeah. yeah, so I want to provide my perspective. So from a method development point of view, I think probably it will take a um, similar approach and have same principle. But in reality, there are differences between the safety and effective studies. For example, um, the population may be different. Um, and because certain adverse events may happen for a subgroup of the population. And then when we look at effectiveness, we want to examine the effectiveness for all of them. Second, that for safety events, many of them are acute transient events. And for the effectiveness that is, we want the vaccine to be effective. We want the effective to be uh, the protection can last long. So we need to put different consideration. And also for many adverse events, they are very rare outcomes. And our um, effective outcome may not be as rare. So when we choose the negative controls, we need to take that into consideration. Think about the, uh, the prevalence of, of the outcome. 
So I think in reality, there are many practical issues we need to consider. Um, mm. Again, there's no one size fits all solution. We need to um, take that into consideration when we look at each. Um, any other comments on this? Great discussion. Um, I'll, I'll briefly come in. I, um, I agree with what the, the, the panelists have been saying on this. Um, I think rather than maybe a difference in methods, um, maybe it goes back to the utility of the, the negative controls and maybe to the type of confounding. Um, notoriously, confounded by indication could be so strong that you know um, it, it may very well be that you know calibration may not actually be. Uh, you know, e even sufficient in that sort of scenario. So I think um, looking at the scenarios that this is applied in uh, is certainly going to be important. Right. And then um, I, I appreciate the comments about the same um, basic framework, different kinds of areas of emphasis and, and um, specific issues and applications. Um, we've talked about what some of those different kinds of applications might be to help uh, flesh this out. Um, I would say it's been... Um, interesting to see how much um, in, um, involvement there is both on the um, the, the um, potential application for, for drugs and biologics. And uh, I know we've had CEDAR and CBER uh, perspectives as part of putting this together, but do you see any um, special considerations for the different types of products where um, these issues might be applied and the, and, and the regulatory implications uh, associated with that? Or, or does the same framework that you all just described apply to that too? I think it's the same principle, but again, there are different challenges when we look at the drugs and the vaccines. For example, for vaccines, we have the underreporting vaccine status, but for drugs, sometimes uh, for the OTC drugs or for the drugs that's not reported to the claim data, we won't be able to capture it. And also for um, um, some medical health outcome, for example, the, um, the FDA draft guidance mentions some example. There are health uh, outcomes that related to privacy issues, such as the sexual transmitted disease, mental health issues, or substance abuse. And then it's possible that um, the patient may not um, go through the insurance claims data. They may attend some federally uh, funded programs, or they may go to a private clinic and decide to pay out of pocket. So there are um, different challenges associated with different types of um, product. But again, we need to understand the data well and identify the potential source biases. But um, I say that the same principles apply. So we're, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to ask all of you for just uh, any final thoughts, any issues that, that would be good for the next steps in this overall effort that we haven't heard uh, heard about already in this session. Um, but I did before doing that, Daniel, maybe, maybe this is a longer question, but maybe like a minute on um, in terms of EMA activities underway now, uh, um, uh, are there any kind of parallel similar activities in Europe that could be coordinated better with this upcoming effort? I mean, I, I think um, we'd always be open to that conversation. Uh, we recognize the importance of negative controls, and I think somebody quite helpfully posted a, a question or a comment in the chat saying that, uh, you know, it was featured in the uh, NSEP methods guide that we have there. Um, so uh, it, it's something of interest. Um, we have uh, sort of recently established methodological working parties. So, um, and part of that will be to look at real world evidence as well. So uh, I suspect these features, these will feature in, in some of those discussions. But yes, um, if, if there's interest, you know, let, let's get talking. <laughs> Great. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Also appreciate the comment from the uh, Uppsala Monitoring Center, uh, which I think is, is related to this general topic, too. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes. Um, uh, any um, final thoughts? And maybe I'll uh, start with our panelists for, for that and then go back to our uh, uh, opening speakers. So, uh, Rohini? Um, I actually don't think I have anything to add that hasn't been addressed yet, but yeah, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to, to seeing the next steps. Thanks, Josh. Nothing to add. I would just re-emphasize that I think the detection part of this whole framework is some low-hanging fruit that could be gone after. 
Yeah. Uh, Susan? Um, I guess just a question has arisen in my mind. We have the list of negative control exposures that Odyssey has compiled. Um, it seems to me that negative control outcomes would be a lot harder to come by for new drugs since mm -hmm. by definition, they're less known. So maybe there's some you know, clinical biological plausibility. Um, so I'm just wondering if there should could be a central effort focused around clinicians to, to come up with some kind of framework for identifying potential negative control outcomes completely out of my area of expertise, obviously. No, good, uh, good point, though, but it fits in with that triangulation uh, strategy that we talked about during the session. Uh, Daniel? No, I, I agree with everything people have said. One thing, just be, uh, keep the projects multidisciplinary. I think it'll benefit from input from many different types of backgrounds. Yeah, and the, the, the breadth of applicability of the methods and, and the opportunity here, the way this is being set up to um, have a general framework, but as, as you emphasized, uh, different relevant kinds of applications, um, seems like it could be very powerful. So, uh, Rich, Yoon, any final thoughts before we wrap up? Uh, yeah, nothing from me. Um, just thanks to the panel, a lot of really helpful and interesting comments. Um, that it definitely are worth taking into consideration that I'll take back to our team and discuss. Thank you. Yeah, so we're in the early stage of the proposal development and we we'll welcome any feedback and suggestions. And thank you for the panelists for the very helpful suggestions. And also for the audience, if you have any questions or suggestions or comments, reach out to us. Thank you. And we did get some good additional uh, questions, comments in, like uh, potential differences in um, studies and, and how uh, these techniques might be used on different kinds of study designs, cohort design, case control, et cetera. We'll pass those along, too, um, but really appreciate the rich discussion from all of you and from everyone else who uh, is contributing today. So uh, that actually brings us to our final session of this workshop on key stakeholder perspectives. For this session, we're going to hear, be hearing some initial reactions, comments, and feedback from a range of stakeholder partners, including industry and academic representatives, on the emerging landscape of negative controls and specifically on the techniques covered in the earlier sessions, uh, the approach of the demonstration projects as they're coming together and evolving, and the overall big picture considerations for understanding and then making use of the potential value of negative controls in the Sentinel initiative. And as I would add to that for um, uh, regulatory applications, uh, even beyond Sentinel. Um, speakers here are going to provide some opening comments to get the discussion going. Um, this is intended to be a discussion. This is our last session. So um, even if you don't have a question, if you just have a thought, idea, something you'd like to make sure this uh, important initiative addresses or thinks about going forward, please put those uh, in through the Zoom question tool. Um, uh, feedback, questions, other comments are all uh, appropriate for, for that. FDA really wants to uh, get as much input as possible as it moves forward on trying to support the effective development of the demonstration projects and the um, getting to more uh, use, more routine use of negative controls as part of a regulatory framework. So let me introduce our um, speakers, all of whom I hope have uh, turned on their, their uh, videos or are doing so now. Uh, Rima Ism, who is uh, Director of Statistics Methodology at Novartis Health Solutions. Uh, Leah McGrath, who's Director of the Vaccines Team and the Real World Evidence Center of Excellence at Pfizer. Um, uh, Alan Burkhart, uh, Alan, good to see you again, Professor in the Department of Population Health Sciences at Duke. And George Ripsack, who's the Vivian Beaumont Allen Professor at Columbia University's Department of Biomedical Informatics. Uh, we're gonna hear some opening comments from each of these speakers. And then again, wanna hear from all of you and have some further discussion. So uh, Rima, let's start with you. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for, for inviting me to the workshop. And uh, really, it was exciting to hear about all of the demonstration projects and some of the work that was done on negative controls. Um, I'll first start with the disclaimer. Uh, my experience has been largely um, in the use of real world data outside of vaccine development. So a lot of my comments are going to probably more apply to maybe drug um, uh, studies than uh, vaccine safety or effectiveness. 
Um, so again, because this is the last panel, a lot of my comments and my talking points are already mentioned. So uh, my work here will be to re reiterate some of the, the main points. So the, the first comment is endorse uh, a lot of the previous speakers who were um, asking to prioritize the goal of detection of unmeasured bias or confounding over the goal of correction of unmeasured confounding. Um, I agree that um, in any comparative studies, um, using uh, a negative control outcome is a good design practice that I endorse. I liked um, um, Professor Chechen, Chechen, Chechen um, uh, his uh, wording of hidden treasure. I think that's exactly what negative controls are. Uh, conver conversely, correcting for bias using the methods that were discussed today, whether it's the dance algorithm or some of the Odyssey work, uh, requires a big level of trust uh, in the assumptions or the how the selection of the negative controls are done. And I think that's better handled case by case um, rather than as a routine use. So um, that was my first comment, <laughs> is to prioritizing the goal of detection. The second is uh, the concern of, uh, about um, uh, routine use of any of these methods. Um, um, and uh, there are three reasons, really echoing uh, some of the ones that were mentioned earlier. First, um, there is no guarantee that a negative control exists in any type of problem, a causal inference problem. So requiring to find one is a, it's a tall order. And um, the trade-offs that we saw is that something like the dance algorithm that has a very uh, set uh, selected criteria may not find anything. And then on the other hand, if you have an Odyssey um, uh, type uh, algorithm that's a little bit more loose in their definition of uh, negative control, you might find a lot, but then you may not trust uh, what you find. So um, the... The, especially, uh, I guess, for the data-driven approaches that can find many, um, if you don't make the assumption of the U-confounding that there is a, a shared source of bias, then how can um, bias in a negative control relationship say anything about the bias in the causal question of interest if there is no shared um, uh, structure? So that's the first reason. Negative controls for routine use are difficult because they're hard to find. The second is, um, validity, and that was brought up in the second panel. Um, uh, in some of the databases, not all outcomes are validated, and not exposure, not all exposure codes have been validated as well. So, what does it mean um, to uh, find um, or to uh, use a negative control when it's poorly validated? It has a poorly validated assessment in that database. And then conversely, how feasible would it be to validate not only the exposure and the outcome of interest in that database, but also a whole set of negative control candidates? It, it may not be feasible in practice. So the second concern is really about validity uh, of the assessments of these negative controls in a database. Um, the third is about prioritizing the concern of a measured confounding in routine practice over all the other concern. In fact, uh, in the drug space, there has been already a demonstration project that was funded by the FDA, the RCT duplicate. And as far as I know, in that particular experiment, um, the concern over a measured confounding was not actually the main potential source of bias. Instead, there was also con concern of our selection bias and then um, the outcome and exposure um, validation. So in that investment of uh, sort of using a lot of methods in any given problem, um, what is uh, the added uh, benefit sort of of these methods um, instead of using other ones? And I think this, these types of considerations are better treated case by case rather than in routine use. So given all these comments, where, where do I follow? Where, where are my three suggestions <laughs> on use and implementation? Well, first, um, I think um, I fully agree that negative control should be as an option in the toolbox um, for Sentinel. Um, not necessarily as a routine use, but certainly as a consideration. Um, and certainly prioritize a measured confounding and considering its impact. Um, in that toolbox, I would also include sensitivity analysis that were mentioned today and also the e-values, maybe to just give you a sense of how much um, the concern of a measured confounding is to begin with. The second suggestion is to share um, the experience. And definitely, the more we learn about uh, practical uses of these negative controls, a library would be helpful because it could cut time and effort 
in finding and justifying these negative controls uh, if we have a similar causal inference questions and methods. And then my third suggestion is that, at least in the drug space, it seems that there's a lot more um, uh, work that has been done on using um, in the self-control design, using time um, as a, a negative control, time periods as a negative control, or um, in the pregnancy registry. And I think those are maybe good places to start where there is a more maturity in terms of use. Um, so uh, those were all my comments. I hope they were easy to follow and reiterating some of what was said before. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. You covered a lot of ground, uh, Rima. Next, I'd like to turn to Leah. Good afternoon. My name is Leah McGrath, and I'm a director on the vaccine team in the real world evidence center at Clemson Pfizer. And I lead the RWE efforts for COVID and mRNA vaccines. Uh, I would first like to just thank the FDA and the Duke Margolis um, group for inviting me to speak at this really exciting workshop. And it's been a really great day of listening to all of these um, presentations. Um, I think, again, I, I too feel like a lot of the points have been said. Um, I was going to kind of get into a lot of the vaccine side, um, kind of, which is a nice follow up to what Rima just mentioned from the drug side. Um, I think we can all agree that that vaccines are definitely an area where um, prime area for needing negative controls. Um, there's often no active comparator options and there's a lot of behavioral differences in people who, can, who get vaccinated versus those who do not. And even in, in studies where you're looking at relative effectiveness, um, such as, for example, looking at COVID boosters versus those who only have a primary series, there's still likely a fundamental difference between those groups that are not easily measured. So I, I definitely agree with the group. There's clear um, indication for negative controls for bi bias detection, and would also agree that um, you know that's something that could be relatively easily implemented. Um, I do think that that when choosing negative controls, you know, there's we've talked a lot about domain experience versus automated algorithms. I think. There's still a very clear need for clinical domain experience, um, a deep understanding of relationships between exposures, outcomes, and confounders. Often those confounders, especially in vaccine studies, um, involve highly complex relationships involving human behavior, which is hard to measure. Um, and that's gonna be really very much guided by routine you know, experience and routine clinical practice. But I'd also say that clinical expertise isn't just isn't enough on its own. Um, so when we talk about real world evidence studies, we often talk about whether a data source is fit for fit for fit for purpose. <laughs> um, and I would pose that the same evaluation kind of framework um, should be done when considering the selection of negative controls. And I think a lot of these points have already been raised previously. Thinking about the prevalence of the negative control the calendar time under which the negative control will be selected and the ability to capture the negative control and the data and the degree of misclassification are all things that would kind of play into whether there's a fit for purpose negative control available. Um, I would also just bring up the point about, um, I think Rohini mentioned this earlier, but something I've been thinking about recently is whether relationships between exposures and outcomes and a negative control change over time, almost like a time varying negative control um, relationship. And, um, you know, either fundamentally from a clinical perspective, things are changing with regards to, you know, vaccines available or drugs available. Um, but secondarily, changes in data capture may also be occurring. So, as an example, billing codes are changing over time. Um, this could impact the relevance of negative control. Um, and a, a really good recent example of this is the post-COVID condition code that recently was added to ICD-10 coding schema. Um, we know that this is still you know, evolving in practice about what post-COVID condition actually means. And so using that code um, you know, in, a data, in an electronic data source um, could actually be changing over time. Um, this may not affect some therapeutic areas. They might not be in such a state of flux, but I think time is something that should really be an important factor to consider when you're looking at different negative controls. So I think 
you know, a purely automated approach, maybe going a little far and that, um, you know, sometimes I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that automated algorithms will be able to take all these factors into consideration fluently. Um, but I think that um, some of these new methods are, are, exci are exciting and that uh, it could be very useful for initial screening and hypothesis generation and then potentially followed up with, you know, a panel of expert opinion and that sort of thing. And again, agree with Rima, you, you took my point as well about there are situations when there may no, be no plausible negative controls available, um, whether this is due to either structural considerations involving, like, for example, the medication that just causes a lot, linked to a lot of different things, um, or whether it's a data problem. So you just don't have the ability and the data set at hand to find a good negative control. Um, in this case, I think thinking about alternate data sets or linking data using novel data sets could broaden the scope of available negative controls. And I was really excited to, to hear that about the earlier study today, the flu study where they linked the, the, um, the survey results with the claims. I think things like that will really help move the field forward as well. Um, I do think that there is a desire for using calibration. So I've definitely been in some discussions where the, the question came up is like, well, so what, what are we, what are we gonna do next if we identify a signal with our negative control? Um, I think there is a current gap in practice with regards to implementing some of these adjustment methods. I know they, you know, these are very new methods and um, very exciting times. I, I would encourage this group to think about how the methods can be disseminated for mainstream use. Um, I love that there are applications that are being conducted. I think that's a great, these use cases are really exciting. Um, I think the more applied examples we have, the better. And I'm also happy to hear that some of the groups presenting today are working to simplify the programming and the implementation through open source package development. I think that will also go a long way. But just thinking a little bit about how we can kind of disseminate some of these technical methods into kind of a more mainstream group would be something of interest as well. So I think we can all agree that the methods to increase confidence in real world evidence are needed. I think negative controls are a powerful tool. They can be considered if the research question, the confounding structure and the data support them. And I look forward to further discussion and thinking through how we can use these in the future. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks very much for those comments, um, uh, Leah. Next, I'm going to turn to Alan. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, the FDA and the Margolis Center for inviting me to participate in this workshop on, on NCOs. Um, so again, I, I'm probably going to reiterate a lot of points that have already been made. It's the problem of coming last. Um, but uh, you know, as, as has been noted, NCOs have been used informally for you know, for decades in epidemiology to detect uncontrolled confounding. Um, as RWE is becoming more increasingly used to support regulatory decision making, it's uh, great to see the agency now starting to consider how NCOs can be best used to uh, improve the reliability of real world evidence. Um, it was great today to see so much formal development of NCO methods. Um, all the impressive work being done by uh, doctors uh, Eric Chechen, Zhu, and colleagues. Um, I was particularly interested to hear about the proximal causal learning idea that struck me as, as very novel and important. Um, I was also very interested to hear about the uh, disconnected negative control idea, which is also new to me. I think, you know, in my view, at a high level, there are really two major issues here related to NCOs. One is how do we select them? And two is what do we do with them once we've selected them? Uh, with respect to the first issue, you know, we, we've heard that the property of being a negative control outcome is ultimately a question about causality and, and is therefore not something that is empirically verifiable. So it, it relies on subject matter knowledge. Uh, in the work that, that I've done with NCOs, at least recently, what we've done is essentially to follow uh, sort of semi-formal process of interacting with subject matter experts uh, to first identify the possible domains of confounding, 
Uh, this comes from their understanding about how medicines are used. Uh, in other words, what are the dynamics that, that may result in confounding, for example, confounding by indication, confounding by the healthy user effect, if we, as we've heard about today, uh, confounding by frailty or functional, functional impairment. And then given these hypothetical domains, can we identify outcomes that may be reflective of the domains, but could be reasonably argued to be unrelated to treatment? Uh, so, for example, we've used cubitus ulcer uh, bed sores as a negative control outcome uh, to capture differences in frailty between treatment groups. Uh, we often are looking at use of preventive health care services, such as various types of cancer screening tests, as an outcome that is reflective of differences in uh, uh, health behaviors between patients or, or potentially access to care. Um, I can tell you that, uh, you know, from personal experience, it's often quite hard to find NCOs that everyone agrees on. So even when you have subject matter knowledge uh, around the table, subject matter experts, often it's hard to get them to, to agree on, on what's a reasonable negative control outcome. Uh, that said, I think there, there are many uh, great NCOs that I think are relatively uncontroversial. Many of the previous speakers have talked about uh, early uh, outcomes uh, during the pre-flu season as, as negative control outcomes for studies of the influenza vaccine. Um, I think that's you know, really a classic NCO in our field. Uh, often people are looking at early events shortly after treatment starts. For example, we've used uh, early fractures after start of osteoporosis treatment as a negative control outcome as a way of, of detecting differences in disease severity between uh, treatment groups, which seems reasonable because it takes time to build bone. Uh, and this, this idea has been, been used elsewhere. So I think this is probably, this kind of approach is what's, what's most often used to identify uh, NCOs. Uh, today, we've heard about some other approaches as well. Um, I found the disconnected NCO approach uh, presented today to be quite interesting. Um, uh, it seems like under certain assumptions, we can identify a particular type of NCO, this disconnected NCO, uh, uh, without any sort of, with only making modeling assumptions. Uh, these, these modeling assumptions, uh, I need to understand them better, but they do seem, uh, do seem quite strong. Uh, in particular, they seem to be based on the, a linear structural equation model. But I think my, my larger sort of question about these uh, NCOs is, you know, how common they are, um, and, and will the ones that we find be sensitive to unmeasured confounding? Uh, so, for, for example, some of the well-known NCOs that have been used, such as uh, outcomes during the pre-flu season, would those be uh, disconnected NCOs? It seems like they, they probably wouldn't be, or early events um, after start of treatment. Uh, so I'll be, very, I'll be very excited to see the results of the uh, study that uh, Dr. Weiss described earlier, and, and in particular, what NCOs um, are identified as part of this process. So the, the high throughput approach to selecting NCOs that's been described by uh, Patrick Ryan and is used by the Odyssey group, that is essentially a fairly aggressive approach to uh, selecting NCOs. Um, the advantage, in my view, of this kind of approach is that uh, you're likely to be including many true uh, NCOs in your set. I think the downside is that you may be including some variables that aren't um, actually related to unobserved confounding, and so therefore not sensitive to, uh, won't be able to detect unobserved confounding. Uh, it, it may be the case as well that these will pick up variables that, that are, that are uh, actually affected by treatment uh, and therefore not valid NCOs. Um, I also uh, am not sure if the, the toolkit that is used by Odyssey is able to look at kind of early events, looking at timing of outcomes, such as outcomes after the receipt of the influenza vaccine, but um, that, may be, that may be something worth um, adding to the, uh, the toolkit if it's not already there. In my own personal preference would be to sort of use a smaller set of carefully selected NCOs, um, uh, but I appreciate the need for a sort of more automated high throughput approach that's been that's been described. Um, before I move on to sort of the second issue, I would like to sort of make one general appeal to, to the scientists on this call. Uh, I think probably a lot of the RWE that will be submitted to the agency will involve treatments for cancer. Uh, many of the studies uh, being done now involve, for example, use of external control arms. I think these studies are quite different from studies of vaccines or treatments for uh, chronic disease. Uh, 
Uh, the domains of confounding are totally different. The follow-up is often short. Cancer EHR data are typically uh, fairly limited and won't contain many of the uh, types of outcomes that we've been discussing, for example, the use of preventive healthcare services. So I think this is an area uh, uh, urgently in need of uh, further research. So uh, with respect to the, the second open issue, what do we do with NCOs once we've selected them? Um, so the, the Odyssey approach described by uh, Patrick Ryan uses a very large set of NCOs to calibrate p-values and confidence intervals. It seems to me that this is mostly about controlling false discovery rate. Uh, Susan Gruber raised the issue of, of, of uh, actually impairing a, a, a type 2 error rates as well, which is uh, you know, a potential concern. Uh, I was really intrigued to hear about the various approaches presented by uh, Drs. Chechen, Shi, and others uh, that involve adjusting effect estimates using uh, negative control outcomes and negative control exposures. Uh, these approaches seem very promising to me. Uh, I, I'm eager to try to use them in my own work. Uh, one concern that I have with these approaches is that if the NCO suggests that there's a tremendous amount of unmeasured confounding, would we feel comfortable uh, sort of de-biasing an estimate, uh, you know, in an extreme manner? For example, if our study is finding that treatment is increasing mortality risk, but after uh, after applying one of these procedures, we now conclude that treatment is in fact protective. Would we feel comfortable with that conclusion? Um, I often have similar concerns in studies where there's a tremendous amount of observed confounding. You know, am I confident in these cases that I've fully, fully adjusted this with my uh, approach using, say, propensity scores? Or is there a substantial amount of residual confounding still present? Um, I'd like to second what Rohini Hernandez said earlier, uh, considering that perhaps in some cases we might simply use negative control outcomes as a gate. Uh, we might use them to determine whether or not we should proceed with a particular study, uh, or perhaps we could use them to identify subgroups uh, or, or, or populations where confounding may be less problematic. Uh, so if one observes a very strong association between treatment and an NCO, even after statistical adjustment, uh, is it reasonable to conclude that the unmeasured confounding is simply too problematic and therefore we shouldn't proceed at all with any sort of analysis? Uh, this, of course, raises the question of how we would make this decision. Uh, how do we know whether this gate, as Rohini described, it should be open or, or left closed? Uh, so I'll, I'll wrap up. I think you know one point that is worth repeating um, is that all of the methods that have been discussed here today uh, are making various assumptions. Uh, some of these assumptions are much more aggressive than others, but there's no free lunch anywhere. So I think it's going to be very important that whatever methods end up being recommended for use have clear assumptions that we can reason about and clearly communicate to the various stakeholders. Terrific. Really appreciate all the comments, Alan and uh, George. I'd like to turn to you next. We're definitely getting plenty of material even as we get towards the end of the, the panel. So uh, thanks. Hi, and thank you. Thank you to the FDA and to the Center for inviting me, and thank you for all the very clear presentations. First, let me just say I believe that the FDA should pursue negative controls in their various forms, so that overall I think it's a uh, prosperous direction to go in. One point I think we need to be modest while still pushing forward. I mean, uh, what I do like about the distribution of many negative controls is the weaker assumption that there's a distribution of confounding structures and, uh, <clears throat> and that the hypothesis is drawn from the same distribution. Whether you use that just for detection of bias or adjustment is a separate question. With the single negative control, uh, yes, there are strong assumptions on the confounding structure. And sometimes there's a logical reason you can trust it, but otherwise um, there are strong assumptions. So when I did a recent study, I reviewed five observational trials of the same hypothesis, five different sets of confounders, each claiming to know it. So our domain knowledge um, can uh, not be that reliable. More proximal is uh, looking at negative controls, say, in vaccine effectiveness. So one of the published negative controls for vaccine effectiveness is looking at the first week, because we know there's no biological effect yet. Uh, we published, a, and that's been used in many studies that are published. In BMJ Open, we published a paper where we did 
such a study and we found high effectiveness the first week and then low the second, moderate the third and rising the fourth, fifth and sixth. So weeks two to six uh, matched clinical trials and week one was high. We have the charts, we reviewed the charts, read the notes, the doctor's notes. They commented on how patients came so late because the symptoms of COVID and the vaccine overlap so much. So they had lower uh, health seeking behavior in the first week. Whereas in the later weeks, we expect it was higher in that group. And we also looked at the severity of COVID and it was higher in the vaccinated group again in the first week. So there's an example where we have something we reasonably believe is a good negative control, yet the actual effect is not only difference, it's in fact completely reversed in the opposite direction. If we had used that to correct the later weeks, we would get the wrong answer. I think if you know there's a specific confounder that you recognize through domain knowledge, you know that there are surrogates for it and they're not associated with the um, exposure outcome, then yes, you can do a uh, correction. And so, but I would say, I'd like to bring up this, be explicit about a dichotomy that has been implicit in the discussion. One dichotomy is do we detect or adjust? A second dichotomy, do we need domain knowledge or empirical? But a third dichotomy is, um, is it a single unobserved confounder you're correcting for and you're working hard on that single thing? Or are you worried about all other unmeasured confounding that you may not be thinking of? And I think those are two different approaches and maybe demand two different methods and maybe complement each other. And I think that the single, when you have the da, um, you know, a causal diagram and adjust for it, that's different than coming up with a distribution of negative controls. Second point, I recognize that the FDA has an additional challenge that we researchers don't have. Whether you pick one negative control or many, uh, you end up with signals, either due to chance or due to unmeasured confounding. What has to be pursued in case it's a real signal uh, for a product? I believe that if you do a distribution of negative controls, it's legitimate to only report the distribution of the answers and not go into the individual hypotheses, but I recognize that that's a challenge the FDA has to face. Third, the importance of evaluation. Simulation is a critical first step, but they need to be tested on real world uh, studies and we need the uh, operating characteristics. And the only way you can do that is by doing a lot of real world studies. The systematic approaches do have an advantage uh, where you can kind of do many of them and scale up the evaluation and see how it behaves um, you know, in vivo. Fourth, we just have to recognize plausibility to the public. And frankly, the public includes journal research, journal reviewers. Uh, my experience is the more co the complexity of the causal diagram is inversely proportional to the acceptance by the reviewers. Um, there was a question in the chat about the acceptance of reviewers for p-value calibration or for confidence interval calibration, actually, uh, what we found is that the reviewers are comfortable. We, you always show both and you look for small differences between the two um, and they've been comfortable for that. If you find a huge difference, then you really have to be worried no matter what. And then it's being used as detection. So you might be a small adjustment, but and then if it's large, that's detection and canceling the study. And then lastly, on the question of just detection versus correction going a little bit further, I mean, um, you know, is it legit and, and type two error rates? I don't know, if I did a study and got a lot of safety signals and then discovered that my sample had clustering among the subjects, would I wanna publish the original because it had the highest power and showed me the most safety signals or would I wanna reanalyze it for clustering, lose power and lose some safety signals so it's not about getting the highest type two error, it's about getting the right type two error for the sample that you have. If using large scale negative controls, you discover that you have a lot of bias, uh, then you've got to realize that your assumptions are weaker. But I do believe you should show both the calibrated and uncalibrated. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Gruber mentioned a paper and, and I believe it did show that if you have a large number of negative controls with uh, the same strong uh, confounding, and if your hypothesis has very different or no confounding, you will miscalibrate. And so I agree with that. That goes for many negative controls, or even if you have a single negative control that has very different confounding, you're gonna get the wrong answer. So we need to do that. What I like again about the uh, distribution of negative controls, but they're drawn not from a set of identical uh, confounding, 
but from a range of confounding and helps us see what we're doing and find the kind of confounding that we don't know ahead of time so that we can uncover confounding that we may have missed. And I think that's the important part of the large scale negative controls. Mark, you're muted. Yeah, and those are my best points of the day too. <laughs> no, I just wanted to, to thank you all for some excellent comments to, to really um, frame and, and help us think about how to move forward on um, this, this whole important um, line of uh, pharmacoepidemiologic analysis as well as possible. I don't see any uh, further comments and or questions in the chat at this point. I find it hard to believe that we've exist, exhausted all the topics, but you all did a great job of uh, uh, of covering the ground with, with your comments. Um, I have a couple that I'd like to follow up on. Um, one, maybe starting to see if any of you all have any thoughts on this. One of the, the, the last uh, really good points that um, George raised was essentially, George, about translating the methods and the, the finding from these negative control methods to broader audiences, since they could end up being used and likely would end up being used if, if these methods go forward effectively for some important decisions uh, about um, uh, guidance and, and regulation of, of medical products. So this is pharmacoepidemiology, but the methods here that are being used uh, more commonly have been explained pretty well. You know, we're accounting for differences that we see by matching up similar patients as closely as possible. We're comparing some groups of patients that got treated differently for reasons unrelated to their health. Um, any thoughts that you all would like to add on how to help bring these methods more into the um, mainstream of people who are concerned about making the right regulatory decisions for, for medical products? And sorry, I'm going off script here. It just seems like an important uh, topic given the potential importance of these uh, methods for the future. I mean, one small thing we've been doing is um, taking our methods, using it on observational studies and correlating with the RCT. So our hypertension legend study finding of the 30, um, hypo uh, the 30 um, studies, uh, randomized trials that we matched with our observational studies we had the same confidence interval uh, for 28 of them. So that means we're off by 6%, which is about the percent you'd be expecting by chance. So it seems like we're, you know, in a, sorry to reuse the word, uh, well calibrated there, but that's just one study. I think we need to do a lot more studies on comparing our evidence to triangulate as was said earlier. Yeah. And that's how a lot of other epidemiologic met methods have become more widely used for, for bringing real world evidence uh, to, to regulation. Right, well, let me ask one other question that has come up a, a lot and that I wanted to make sure we got this group's um, perspective on. You all raised a ton of important issues for getting from where we are now with some very promising findings, uh, maybe even compelling. Uh, um, again, you don't get something for nothing. There's no free lunch, but um, uh, really a promising ability to extend out what's been done so far in Sentinel, Odyssey and other um, major observational study initiatives. Um, but there were a number of calls throughout the day for basically how can we get more systematic and more effective about sharing all the experiences that are going on now. Um, for example, it sounds like many companies are using um, these negative control methods in some way. Maybe it's uh, internally for thinking about designing further studies, et cetera. Um, they're becoming more explicit parts of, of or have become explicit parts of Odyssey. We're obviously going to be getting there for Sentinel. How can we augment that? Are there, are there steps that uh, FDA could take or that we could take as a community to uh, encourage more transparency, especially in the, the, the near-term opportunities for advancing the use of these methods? I love the idea that's been raised, uh, it was raised earlier about almost having a library of negative control outcomes for different studies that, you know, maybe are selected in a very rigorous way that, uh, that, that, that can be used in any particular study. I think that to me seems quite valuable. I, I guess my only concern about that is that they may work well in some settings, but not other settings, right? So if confounding changes, for example, mm -hmm. so that what's the, the things that are driving prescribing are different in one setting than in another, uh, 
right? A negative control outcome that detects uh, uncontrolled confounding in one setting may not work in another. So that would be my only uh, my only concern about that kind of approach. But I think that would be that would be really valuable. We you know in the studies that I've been involved with, we spend quite a bit of effort trying to identify these things. Um, you know, before we do the study. So it'd be nice just to have a have a set of them that we could uh, we could deploy. Yeah, and both in terms of the subject matter expertise um, validation and, and the statistical validation. It seems like there's some um, resources like that already available for the negative control exposures, like some of the work that Odyssey's done and so forth. And clearly, you know, the, the apple, as we heard repeatedly, the application, the area in which these are being used uh, matters, um, but maybe that could be built into... Um, any other thoughts on that topic? Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I did suggest a library, and I think it's it's a yeah. great um, it's a great starting point. I think it will be specific to whichever not only the causal question but also the database in which this question was sort of asked, um, especially when it comes to outcome um, or exposure uh, validity and maybe how well it will apply to another problem. I think what would be interesting in the library is not just uh, sort of the citing the, the problem because a lot of review papers had a lot of other examples. It's, it's more the reasoning that goes into um, sort of eliciting, finding and justifying um, that negative control, uh, especially for, uh, for answering a regulatory question. I think also that kind of um, library could help you know, build arguments and also um, try to see where can I find the gaps in knowledge, maybe to make the case for a particular uh, for a particular negative control. So um, yeah, I think that library was would be very very helpful because definitely the biggest barrier in using negative controls is finding them and justifying them. Yeah. And I would just add not just the database, which of course is very important, but also the time frame from which they're being measured as, as was mentioned, you know, things change over time. And I think time is often the hardest thing to contend with, honestly, in, in a lot of our studies. And so making sure that we are describing and um, assessing kind of the rationale with regards to the calendar time as well would be really important. Great, thanks. Um, so you all have, uh in this throughout this session and people throughout the day have provided a lot of feedback on um, the potential areas for um, incorporating negative controls into regulatory decision making and a lot of comments about some of the challenges and opportunities and all of that. Um, we'd like to spend, we only have a few minutes left, but we'd like to talk a little bit about, a little bit more about making sure we're not missing any areas where you see low hanging fruit uh, in the path forward here. So we just got through this discussion of the initial development and expansion of lists of promising NCEs and NCOs by area of application. Um, I heard earlier in this session about maybe they're maybe also, um, I think you use the term low-hanging fruit, uh, more routine checks for the presence of um, important uh, uh, unmeasured bias. Um, any areas that you'd like to, to highlight uh, before we wrap up for what to do next uh, to, to help move this whole effort forward? I'd, I'd personally like to see some more examples of applications. I mean, I, I love the two that were presented today, but I think the more examples that are provided, the more um, tutorial type papers that are out there that can really help um, bring some of these technical methods out into the kind of the, the real world of, of you, know, you know, outside of academia, I think would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Uh, other thoughts? I agree. I would like also to see examples in comparative effectiveness. I think negative controls have been um, are well documented and have been used a lot in comparative safety, but I think there is no reason why they wouldn't um, be useful in comparative effectiveness. Um, um, and I and I think. Um, again, it, the methodology is already there. <laughs> it's a matter of uh, finding a right application and that maybe will be more compelling. Yeah. I mean, I, mean I think bringing these methods to real clinical studies, I know even if it's early for trust for reviewers yet, if it is, 
they can still be used as a sensitivity analysis. So you do the, the study the old fashioned way, and then you say later on, I'm gonna, I know this may be a problem here, I'm gonna use this special new negative control method. And so you can still get it into current clinical papers under that, um, under the, not guys, but under that approach. And then it starts being seen by more people that way uh, without scaring people. All seem like good opportunities, and we heard some examples uh, today. Heard about some examples today of reanalyses that have been done um, in that way too. Um, and maybe this is an area where, just like FDA is done with these early particular studies, um, just like Odyssey's done to try to highlight and share some examples. Um, maybe there's some more steps that FDA, Sentinel, um, others involved in this effort could take to highlight. You know, potential important opportunities and and ask people to uh, submit examples and help build out that um, uh, that better understanding and and set of uh, set of capabilities. Um, so we are now at the point where I I, I do want to um, ask about um, any final comments that you all have had. So you've had the benefit and thank you and everyone else for sticking with us for the whole day. Um, see one more uh, um, uh, comment that came in, which we'll try to incorporate in the, in the further work. Um, so any other last comments um, from all of you who are with us today, please send those in before we finish. Um, but any final thoughts from you all on um, uh, additional issues to consider? things to watch out for, things to emphasize as this uh, work uh, moves forward. Uh, consider this your kind of closing comments on issues related to negative control techniques for regulatory purposes that we haven't yet touched on or emphasized quite uh, quite enough. Um, who, who would like to start? Maybe I'll start so that I'll leave, uh, give someone else the, the last word. Um, I think negative controls are a hidden treasure, and I think they're great for detecting um, unmeasured confounding, and I'll leave it at that. Great. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Uh, others? Yeah, I would just echo that. I Coming from the vaccine side, it's, this is very exciting. I think negative controls have a real, a real power, um, especially when there's so many behavioral aspects um, that we just can't assess in our data. So I'm really looking forward to how the field progresses, especially with the calibration. Yeah, seems like a really opportune time. Um, Alan? Yeah, well, well, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to see all of the development that's going on. And I, I applaud the, the agency for organizing this and, and, and looking at this and funding these projects. It'll be fun to see how this this evolves over the coming years. Thank you, George. Uh, thank you for having me. And I do believe that um, FDA should move forward with negative controls in its various forms. And I think there's a lot to be learned. Yeah, great. Well, I want to thank all of the participants in this panel. You had a, a big task ahead, uh, synthesizing and, and adding to uh, what's already been a really rich discussion. Uh, I think you did a, a, a great job. And so we really appreciate your helping us close out with some very good ideas for, for moving forward. And just a few other uh, comments from me. Um, I really have been taken by the, the level of interest and enthusiasm and the, the pace, as you said, of you know, these, these um, concepts around negative controls have been around and used in one way or another for, for quite some time, but really does seem like um, uh, in recent years an acceleration of the uh, comprehensiveness, the rigor, and the, the depth of the methods and how to apply them. So it seems like we're at that accelerating part of the S curve here. So really good to see the interest from FDA and all uh, of you who, uh, who care about these uh, regulatory science and data science issues um, coming together to help make the most of the opportunity. Um, uh, and you all did a lot of that today. We talked about the potential for negative controls to detect um, first, and then maybe even uh, correct uh, with, with solid enough uh, understanding all that triangulation around 
subject matter expertise and, and the improving uh, um, understanding of the statistical methods uh, and um, uh, how they're uh, identifying uh, the ability to uh, estimate unmeasured bias, uh, but a lot of progress there to enable more, much more robust uh, causal inference and add to the credibility of, of real world evidence. Would like to start thinking about how to bring um, the, the broader community of makers public uh, uh, along with these steps uh, too. They're, they're an important new dimension to uh, um, what would be regulatory science in this space. Uh, we did cover a range of techniques that are being used in, in practice, focused on some that appear to have the most value for use uh, first, in the Sentinel initiative, um, there is a, a clear need, though, uh, as these methods are becoming more prominent, to keep working on developing and understanding their utility in regulatory settings. And I hope we can work on some of these early steps that were identified, particularly in this last panel, around getting these lists out there um, by area, by data set, um, uh, and linking that to studies that can add these methods on. Maybe they're not uh, full negative control trials themselves, but they can be used, they can use these methods for, for checks on, um, on the approaches that they're adopting and, and so forth. So, so lots of opportunities for some short-term um, steps as well. Um, all of you emphasize the complexity involved with healthcare data and uh, the decisions uh, influenced by human behavior that we're trying to understand uh, better here in observational data and the importance of working across multiple data sources. Uh, also questions about how to select uh, the right NCE, especially NCO candidates for analysis and the trade-offs uh, of the, the different um, approaches, uh, uh, data-driven, empirically driven, uh, um, expert driven uh, that can uh, influence some of those decisions. Um, but fortunately, a, a lot of ideas for how to move forward through a, a kind of a conceptual approach that can be applied in a range of different settings across uh, um, drugs and biologics, across different types of, uh, of data sets um, and, and outcomes as well. Um, so as we continue to learn from these ongoing efforts, uh, it'll be important to continue partnering and, and sharing these experiences to build best practice. I can't think of a, uh, an area of uh, methodologic development in pharmacoepi that probably has more to gain from um, uh, this, these opportunities like today to create a shared community. There's certainly a huge level of interest. There's certainly a lot of activity out there. And given the range of, um, uh, of opportunities for applying these methods, but also the relatively early stage of doing so um, really benefits to have the development of a, of a, of a shared community. And I think uh, uh, Sentinel can be an important part of driving that forward. And it's great to see the strong uh, FDA interest as, as well. So um, this, this extremely helpful feedback uh, from everyone today, all the perspectives, and I would say this is a, a kind of a good uh, assembly of, of what is, uh, I think, in the, the next and latest generation generation of, uh, of um, uh, slide decks, papers, et cetera, to help everyone understand where we are with this field and how to move it forward. It's been sort of like an academic conference in that respect uh, as, as well. So I want to thank all of you for making that possible and thank you in advance for the hard work that still is ahead to turn these opportunities into a real impact on effective regulatory decision making and therefore real improvements in, uh, in, in health for Americans and people around the world. So um, in concluding the workshop, I want to take a, a minute to thank just a little bit more particularly uh, some of the people who spent extra effort on getting us together. Uh, that includes all of our speakers and panelists who not only in many cases shared presentations, but developed background materials or um, uh, working on uh, supporting papers and activities as well. Thanks to all of your insights, we had a great presentation of the um, uh, environment for negative controls and a great foundation for the excellent discussions that followed from that. I'd also like to thank uh, all of our colleagues across uh, different centers at FDA who participated in planning for this event, uh, Catherine Scott, Rich Forshee, Sarah Dutcher, Yun Lu, Patricia Bright, Janet Modal, and many others who put effort into bringing this workshop together. 
Uh, and then uh, uh, thanks as well to our uh, team here at Duke Margolis. This was a, a broad team effort on our part as well. Uh, Rachel Hendricks Stirrup, uh, uh, who moderated the sessions this morning, uh, it was really uh, lively sessions, uh, as well as our project teams, including uh, Adam Atten, uh, Miriam Naffy, Luke DeRocher, Sandra Yanka, Dory Kim, Hannah Gronke, and Christina Bush. And the last thanks to all of you who joined us today and a thanks in advance, since this is gonna be an ongoing field for further work. We hope you all have a great afternoon and look forward to continuing opportunities to collaborate on important topics like this one, uh, negative controls. Take care.